Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Stormkeep. My name is Paul, and with me today I have my co-storm hosts. JJ here and back from vacation. MJ here. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about ally and coalition units for Stormcast. Um, these are not going to be discussions about how good these units are in their own faction. The discussion is purely about how useful these units are in a Stormcast Eternals army. No other consideration is being made besides that, that factor. We're going to be using the exact same ranking system that we used when evaluating the Battle Tome. S-tier units are really, really strong. They have a high impact ability or a unique aspect that can completely define a list. Uh, that scales down in terms of strength and versatility all the way down to D-tier, which is where they are just usually over under or sorry overcosted or just really bad. And F-tier is that they'll never be worth using. You won't see any F-tiers in this list because why would we create a video ranking every single unit that can go in the army if a lot of them are F tier. So we just tried to pick up ones that were, you know, anywhere from S to D. Yeah, I just want to add, this is not a video about uh, just having bodies from other factions, because uh, that's not really like a niche we want to explore. I mean, if you're just looking for bodies, just go for the cheapest ones. These are units that we think can uh, have abilities that are interesting enough to be considered as allies. Yeah, they have to be worth taking instead of Stormcast units, right? That's the criteria here. And mm -hmm. given how good our Battle Tome is and how many good units we have, that's that's really hard to do. Uh, but we did manage to compile quite a thorough list of units here that we're excited to share. Yeah, so, a lot of middle of the run units in this list. C-tier is not bad for an ally, considering uh, there is a lot of C-tier, I'll say that, but it's not bad. For an ally to be C-tier is, is a... Is a high standard. It's worth experimenting. It's worth yeah, experimenting with. For sure. Yeah. So let's start off with the Battle Mage from the Cities of Sigmar. So all the Cities of Sigmar units are really interesting because instead of bringing them as allies, we can run Storm Keeps and use them as coalition units, which means that uh, they still don't count towards our battle line, which is unfortunate. Uh, they, do, they still are battle line, which means you can double reinforce them. They just don't count towards it for pitch battle profile reasons. So... Battle mages, as a hero, if they were coalition, would be able to take an artifact, but that's not why you want to bring a battle mage. The reason you want to bring a battle mage is because they are a cheap wizard with a very good signature spell. That doesn't matter if they're storm keeps or scions. So, just running through the spells they have real quick here, you can play them from Hish, in which case they get Faw's Protection, where you can pick an enemy unit, or sorry, pick a friendly unit, and enemies have minus one to hit that unit. So if you're running uh, a big Star Drake, Hish is a really good wizard to bring alongside it. If you're playing Gur, and I think this one's going to see a lot of play because Gur is also the realm uh, that we're currently in, so you'll get plus one to cast if you play a Gur mage. You get Wild Form, which is plus two run and plus two charge, and that is an mm -hmm. excellent ability. Excellent, absolutely excellent, because we actually have the capacity to give a unit plus two to charge and then translocate it forward. And if you want to yep. combo that with the ability to run and charge from Steadfast March, that gets really, really strong. Assuming they don't make Absolutely. any changes to translocation, of course. Um, yeah, so like if the translocation FAQ doesn't go in our favor, uh, Wildform suddenly becomes a good way to sort of pseudo turn things into that uh, Imperitans seven inch Annihilator strike, um, which is good for Paladins. And uh, like Paul mentioned, for Steadfast March, relying on a D6 roll to run and charge is kind of bad because you can roll a one, but this. If you get this spell off, then it guarantees at least a, a run roll of three. Yeah, minimum three, max eight, which is not bad. Uh, mm -hmm. Shaman or Shaman or Shaman or however people pronounce it uh, gives you transmutation of lead, which picks an enemy unit and it halves its movement. And then if it has a save characteristic of two, three, or four, you can also reroll hit rolls of one. Now that's really useful, not just because you primarily win the game through movement and all the damage you do is just a way to stop people from moving. Uh, Rerolling hit rolls of one is a really rare effect in our book now. The only other source of it is Divine Light, which is a prayer that competes with translocation. So mm -hmm. you won't see a lot of it. <laughs> and it's really yeah. hard to justify bringing you two priests with, with how tight our points are. Uh, so transmutation of lead on a cheap body is pretty good, especially because it also halves enemy movement. It does have a higher cast value than the other spells, so not the best spell to pick. I, I think I'd probably take Wild Form in most scenarios. If you're absolutely because in, uh, in wild form, uh, yeah, because I, I think, yeah, I, I think uh, the spell from Cayman. I'm gonna say Cayman because I, I don't know Balthazar Guild in Total War Warhammer says Shaman, but I don't think it's Shaman. Um, so so transmutation of lead goes off on a seven. Wild form goes off on a five. 
assuming you get the plus one to cast because this season is in Gur, I think Wildform getting going off on a four is just better. Um, and if you take a Star Drake, you know, that's just even more reliable. Yeah, if you have a Star um, Drake, the only way it fails is on a miscast, mm-hmm. which would fail anyway. Yeah. Um, and 234, I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the transition of lead is good because uh, 234 is the save characteristic you're most likely to encounter in uh, Age of Sigmar now. Um, or the, those are the things you really want to reroll things against. So uh, it's a good spell. I can see it situationally being useful, but I'd still always go for the Gur for now. For now, yeah. Uh, in Shaiish, you can do the Pall of Doom. Good name. Minus two bravery mm-hmm. to one enemy within 18 inches. That's a really cheap way to get a, a bravery modifier, which if for some reason you're playing Anvils of the Heldenhammer Hammer with a lot of Lord Exorcist, this could be really useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's also like one of the few ways to reduce bravery because I don't think Stormcast have any decent ways to reduce bravery anymore. Like Draculines are, you know, they're gone. No, I think lost some work I don't traits, think there's a so. single way for a Stormcast Eternal's army outside of allies to reduce bravery. I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm fairly certain. Mm-hmm. Uh, Olgu, so yeah, that could, that could come in easy. Yeah. Olgu gives you the Mystifying Miasma, which is all about controlling enemy movement. They can't run, and they have minus two to charge rolls, and that's a very strong effect. The problem with it is they have to be within 18 inches of you in the hero phase, which means they're probably going to charge you anyway. Mm-hmm. Or they already have. So Olgu, you know, if we end up moving to, to that realm in the future, that could be interesting, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It's it's good. It's a good effect. It's just I wish the range was longer. And I don't think it's worth mm-hmm. comboing out of a spell portal in, in a Stormcast army. Maybe mm-hmm. though, it could be. Like if the meta really shifts towards something really fast, we can, you know, drop a spell portal, uh like translocate a wizard, drop a spell portal somewhere really far up and then and then mystifying miasma out of it. Like that, that could Yeah, be that fun. could be that's a very niche combo, but sure. Um and I if don't it's, really, if I it's a Lord Arcanum, you can also just teleport back. Uh, the the oh, Drift Charger variant. So yeah, it's a really niche mm-hmm. combo, but it's it's uh, an interesting ability. Worth noting for sure. In Gyran, you can cast the Shield of Thorns, which is, it, it just causes D3 mortal wounds anytime an enemy finishes a charge within 3 inches of you. Uh, so you can mm-hmm. combo that with Stormkeep's ability to deal 2 D3 mortal wounds if somebody charges your big Vindictor block. Or you can put it on a Star Drake, and that's a big anvil. Or on a bunch of Stormguard Drake. You know, anything you yeah. want the enemy charging, it adds up as a, as a nice little source of mortal wounds. And it does trigger every time they charge. It's not a one-time thing. Yep, so every time. If they charge it with three units, then they're taking those 3d3 on That's each unit. Or 1d3 on each unit. As we mentioned, the Battle Mage can benefit from the Star Drake. And since he's such a cheap wizard, those extra like 30 to 40 points you're saving compared to other wizards in our army, it does add up. And sometimes you just need a cheap, uh, a cheap spell. And that's what this guy offers mm-hmm. you. And the, the most potent combo I found with this guy in particular is if you translocate a unit up and then you wild form and then you use the steadfast march command, you get a mm-hmm. huge mobility boost on, on something like paladins right now, which are really suffering from enemies using redeployment after you translocate and then move. It effectively mm-hmm. almost cancels out the, uh, the movement, which is hilarious. Uh, but if you have wild form and you can run in charge, you're getting yeah. in. So it, this makes uh, paladin teleport strategies really reliable. I really like using the Battle Mage. Uh, that said, he is incredibly fragile, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Six he up basically save. has no defense to speak of. Yeah. A stiff breeze goes his way, and he just falls over. So he's pretty much good for one turn, and that's about it. Don't rely on him to hold objectives for you on, on some of the battle plans that require heroes. Uh, yeah, and he has no casting bonuses outside of Gur, so the Wild Horton combo will become less reliable once we do eventually leave this, uh, this plane. So mm-hmm. overall, Although, I, I, yeah, there, that is probably why I won't take the transmutation of lead because the plus one to cast, like that, it having a casting value of seven means I'm not going to get that off as reliably as wild form, which goes off on a five right now. So, and one of the you know should be worth mentioning, it's one of the best kits Games Workshop has ever produced. The amount of variety in a multi-part hero kit, I love it. I wish they would do more oh, yeah. of this. It's disappointing that they haven't. Yeah, agreed. So overall, this is, this is an A tier unit. Uh, this is a lot better than many Stormcast Wizards. The versatility and the spell that you pick and the power of certain spells makes him a fantastic choice for, for many, many armies. But we're, we're starting off strong, which is good. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't stay this it way. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't stick. I don't think it sticks. <laughs> Unfortunately. One direction this can go. Well, it could, it could go to S tier. You know, there could be a unit in here that is S tier. So. Well, let's find out. Well, we're going down one, but the Rune Lord... He is good. 
the agency's overall B tier, so it's not like a complete drop like we were alluding to. So uh, the Rune Lord is really good because he is a cheap priest. He can unbind and dispel at plus two, which is really good now, considering uh, Stormcasts have no bonuses to casting or unbinding, aside from Krondis, who I believe he doesn't get unbinding bonuses, just casting. Nope, only it's casting. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, so the, aside from our dispel scroll, which is really good, uh, he is our he's our best unbinder, which is a great choice for only 100 points, especially because if you bring him in a Stormkeep's army as a coalition unit, he can take an enhancement, which means he can take the universal prayers. So you can take either the healing prayer or the uh, command point prayer or curse, potentially even. Uh, there might be some really good combos with curse that you can pull off. Yep. He also has a prayer to increase the rend of a dispossessed unit by one, which we will talk about later. And uh, if, if nothing else, you can always just give a unit a 6 up ward using Bless. So downsides, he's quite slow and quite, fra quite fragile. Uh, he can't mm -hmm. cast any of the Stormcast prayers, which is a bummer, because they're all really, really good. And uh, if you bring him as an ally rather than a coalition unit, he can't learn any of the universal prayers, which lowers his utility. So that kind of means outside of Stormkeeps, I probably wouldn't play him. He has no bonuses to praying, so he's kind of relying on a d6 dice roll. And just like, well, not, not just like the Battle Mage, but he's not much more durable than the Battle Mage. A 4-up save on a 5-win model is it's not worth much. Yeah, agreed. Um, the other thing I would say is, like, in order to make use of his own War Scroll prayers, you really need to be taking dispossessed units. So he sort of wants you to inflict that tax on you. Yeah. Where if you, yeah, if you want to make like full use of this guy's War Scroll. But he he does have a lot of good things going for him. Uh, the the plus mm -hmm. two unbind and dispel should not be underestimated. You can dispel Absolutely. your own endless spells using him, and then recast them later. So like, you can drop a meteor on people. And then dispel it at plus two, and then drop it again next turn. Like, see him and a Lord Arcanum with Master of Magic being really good buddies. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't think that makes the Everblaze Comet worth casting yet because it's still 100 points, but that is a very efficient way to cast it and recast it. Yep. So cycle it, keep cycling it on and yeah. off every other turn. Yep. Or, you know, Geminids or Quicksilver Swords, any, any of these spells. Life Swarm, you can dispel and then double move again in your hero phase. Mm hmm. Next up, we're going to switch it up from Heroes for a bit. We're going to take a look at some War Machine combos here with the Lord Ordinator. Uh, first up, the Gyrocopter. It's got, it has the War Machine keyword, which not every unit that you think would have it actually has mm -hmm. it. This one does have it, which is good. It's very fast, a 16-inch flying move, which is something Stormcast will struggle with, to have just one body move very quickly in a direction. Stormcast are yep. typically not very good at that outside of using Translocation or Stormguard Drakes. Uh, once per game, it can drop Mortal Wound Bombs, which is cool. Uh, it has to pass over a unit in order to do that, so, you know, not That's always That's where that able. 16 helps, really. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. then was... you can do the back and forth kind of thing on them. Yeah, because you have to move fully within the, yep, not fully within the base, but you have to touch, basically fly over the base, and then still end your move more than three inches from an enemy. So flyover mm -hmm. moves are actually a lot more difficult than they seem. Um, but doing D3 Mortal Wounds on a 2-up is good. The Steam Gun does a lot of shots against hordes. And it's only 75 points. One of the best uses I, I've heard of this is that you can just hide them in a corner if you want to do the uh, Sacred Charge grand strategy for some reason. You want to bring two Cities of Sigmar units. Now, for that grand and strategy... Stay alive the whole game. <laughs> yeah. For that grand strategy, I don't think they need to be Stormkeep units. They just have to be Cities of Sigmar. So yes, you can... they need to have the keyword, not be Stormkeep. Yeah. That's right. Now, Stormkeep is a, is a keyword. It's just never referenced anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, downside, it's four wounds on a four-up save. It's only rend one on the shooting, and a lot. And Stormcast are spoiled for how good our shooting is. So it's yep. really, really tough to compete with with our good shooting options. And it has a, a fairly large base. Uh, it's not easy to hide necessarily. It, it, it's visible. It can be shot down. It's not. It's not like yeah, one fifty millimeter away. bases are not like especially when your entire the, the rest of your army is on like these large forty millimeter bases. Fifty millimeter bases are not easy to position yeah um, a consistent problem with with a lot of shooting that stormcast have access to is that if it can't use the double tap it's automatically a lot worse than anything that can use the double tap except for mm -hmm. hurricane raptors but that's another story um, but that is a, it is a serious consideration to spend points on a shooting unit that is not a long strike that good at it. yeah yeah it's yeah. really tough just that doesn't have any mortal wounds or minus two rend at least to yeah. talk about 
Well, despite all those downsides, it's just so cheap and so fast, and it can be buffed by Lord Ordinator. So if you're building like a War Machine kind of list, this guy easily slots into it, right? So yeah, I like it. I think C tier is a fair, fair place for it. Yeah, and I think if hordes come back like next season or something, uh, the steam gun becomes good, especially if you can like translocate or scions in a Lord Ordinator, and then suddenly you're doing like a whole bunch of attacks on like a two plus. Oh yeah, yeah. If you get like three of these guys, right? Because they don't have to be storm keeps; they could just be allies. So you can bring one coalition cities arm unit and one allied cities unit per four mm-hmm. models. So literally half your army could be cities of Sigmar if you wanted. You just yeah. have to carefully balance who's getting the storm keep keyword and bravery and all that nonsense. Kind of a pain, yeah, but yeah, yeah you, you can bring bring more than just one in four. So I like them personally. And yeah. then we're going to take a look at their cousin, the Gyro Bomber, which the chunky uh, cousins. It's it's more expensive, and it's slower, and I believe it doesn't even have the steam gun, but it, it does not. It has the uh, weird the the three shot. The four, yeah. it's the three shot gun, but it goes to four shots, but it hits on fours. I think that's the... yeah. Now, it is still a War Machine, which gets buffed by the Ordinator. So if you're building like a War Machine list, it can be really fun and thematic to use these guys. Um, it is a constant source of Mortal Wounds. Throughout the game, this guy's mm-hmm. going to constantly drop Mortal Wounds. And he's cheap enough that you can still bring him for that grand strategy. Uh, but his shooting is just much worse than his uh, his cousin. He's a little bit more durable. I think he has an extra wound. But the other mm-hmm. ones... I think he's gyro- five wounds. But yeah, yeah, but he loses four inches of movement because of how, I guess, heavy and, they are. And that's a big deal. And- because mm-hmm. he only drops bombs after a normal move. Previously, yep. in second edition, you could have done a run move or a retreat, and still those would qualify as normal moves. Now there's a, a complete distinction in what a normal move is compared to runs and retreats. So the fact that he's only a 12-inch fly move and can't drop his bombs if he runs or retreats is a big deal. It's really hard to, to position something like that. It almost lends him to be like a counter-attacking unit. The enemies already come to you and you fly over them, which yeah, I'd rather just kill them then fly over and try these shenanigans. Uh, it seems too finicky. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's not bad to do mortal wounds throughout the whole game. So D tier is, is where this guy ends up. Probably not worth using in your list, but not the worst choice. Also, these models are great. I've always loved the copy. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. I, I love the Cities of Sigmar War Machines. They have this like old flair to them. They're great. I really hope they get expanded in the Dawnbringer Crusades. Yeah, same. Next up, the Steam Tank. Speaking of old world flavor, uh, this thing just yeah. oozes it. And uh, it is a war machine. It's also fairly durable. It has a 3-up save and I believe 12 wounds. It mm-hmm. has a, a good Ren 2 D6 cannon that fires 30 inches away, which is equivalent to almost equivalent to our Ballista, because our Ballista is 36 inches of Ren 3. It's not as accurate yep. as our Ballista. I believe it wounds on a 3 instead of a 2. Uh, but it has all kinds of other attacks. And it's not it's not the worst in melee, and all of its Steam weapons. Steam tanks wound on twos. I think they hit on fours. It's the problem. Oh, is it? Okay, okay. I could. I, yeah, yeah. I don't have the war scroll in front of me for this one. Yeah, yeah. Seems, yeah. So their wounding is fine. It's just like the hit roll is way yeah. worse, and it can max be buffed to like a three up as opposed to a two up on our ballistas. So okay. Yeah. Well, they're, they're fairly accurate. You know, about as accurate as our ballistas. About as damaging as our ballistas. Uh, but this comes with a hero keyword if you want, which can heal the tank D three, and you can. You can double that up with Heroic Recovery. So you can potentially be healing this thing 2d3 every turn. And Stormkeep mm-hmm. units do get bonuses to Bravery if you're, they're near Redeemer Stormkeep units. Uh, it also does Mortal Wounds on the charge, which, you know, you can combo that with a Stomp from something else. So you can effectively deal a whole bunch of Mortal Wounds on the charge. Because this thing, you can only do one monstrous action, right? Yeah. So if you, if you have this guy charging in alongside monsters, you can do a whole bunch of Mortal Wounds on, on the charge. Yeah, or that combo you mentioned. You, if you take a commander and a coalition, you can give it an arcane tome and do the metamorphosis for, for a stomp, and yep. then do two d three on the charge, which is pretty good. Yep, um, it, it can do its own stomp if you if you are really so inclined. And yeah. it has a I think the main ability. I think the main weakness of this is like its attacks are good even in melee. It's it's not bad. D six attacks on fours and threes minus one two damage. It's just the problem is I think this thing is primarily built for uh, second edition because. It used to have, so its command ability, if you take a commander on it, is it adds one to hit rolls for steam tanks that are near it. Um, You can buff that up with a Lord Ordinator too, but in Age of Sigmar 3rd Ed, the max it can get to is a 3 out, whereas previously it could go to like 2s and 2s. Yeah, Yeah, that that is definitely the downside. Also, its it's command ability, I mean, it's cool because it doesn't use uh, all-out attack, which means you can use all-out attack with another unit and still give this thing plus one hit um, Mm -hmm. if you don't want to bring an Ordinator for some reason or if it's just out of range. 
Um, but it, it, yeah, it hits on fours. It's only getting up to threes at best. And its own shooting attack buff doesn't work on any melee weapons, right? It's not like a, it's not yep. like some armies, like I know Seraphon can buff their units in the hero phase and that lasts throughout every phase, which is really good on their monsters. But this guy is just in the shooting phase. So it's uh, not the most efficient use of a command point, I'd say. And the steam gun is only eight inches, which means you're getting pretty close to the enemy. Like you're shooting this right before you charge at them. And, uh, oh yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, the, the only strongest. yeah the issue you'll find is like I want this to get into the enemy, but I don't like that two d six random move. Like it's two d six random moves are just so bad. Yeah, it also has a really lousy unleash hell. Uh, you'd think with all the guns that are on it, it because the steam gun's only eight <laughs> inches. If somebody does a deep strike charge or or you know eight point one inches, they just plan it perfectly. Or no, no, never mind. That's yeah. Overwatch in 40k. You, you do unleash hell after they finish the charge. So like you'll get yeah, all the but, models but you in still range, have to but be within range of at least the steam gun to like make full use of it. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just firing a cannon, right? Just like one can, like one cannon shot. Yeah, and uh, because it's 12 wounds, it can't get cover or lookout, sir, which is really unfortunate. Uh, you really want uh, a ballista that can get in cover and, and get lookout, sir. That would be great. Um, so C tier, I think, is is fair. It has a lot of good things going for it. Think of it like a more expensive ballista with a whole bunch of extra guns strapped onto it yep and some armor some nice serious yep. armor it can heal itself it can move around and do stuff it's it's fine if you compare it to a ballista it's fine next up the luminarch of hish uh gives a six up ward to all nearby cities units so if you're using multiple cities units you can just give them all six up ward and that includes itself of course it gives plus one to unbinding for all battle mages including itself it has a Pretty cool Mortal Wound shooting attack, which if you're playing a Mortal Wound bomb list, this is a really good inclusion because 30-inch line, you can do it from really far away, hit a bunch of units in a row, and on a two-up, they all take D3 mortals. Well, you have to roll for each one, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, two-up is pretty reliable. I, I, I take that. I mean, it's... Uh, the it's, fact that it, it does it like every nice turn, ability. like a lot of the mm -hmm. guaranteed effects are, you know, like the Knight Judicator's four-up in an area and the Knight Vexilor's once per game. A lot of these effects are constrained in some other way, so a two up to deal D three every turn is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, you can also stick a battle mage on it. You don't have to, but you can. In which case, uh, gets a two really good spells. Pause protection is good, and burning gaze is good. Both really yeah, good spells. Yeah, I mean, we just talked about uh, pause protection is the minus one to hit. So uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a good spell to have. Yep, and you don't necessarily need to put the wizard on it, right? For only two hundred and twenty points, you can just take this thing as a mortal wound cannon that fires every turn. And yeah. mortal wounds are, are uh, the more of them you get, the better they get, because there's always a critical mass of them. You'll never get enough to kill a Gargant in one turn, but if you can get you know 5d3 mortals in an area, you can really punish people's tight, close, uh, close formations. Agreed, yeah. It, uh, it, it really punishes some formations. And if you think about it in terms of how a Night Judicator works, a Night Judicator is, what, 205? This thing's only 15 points more. So in terms of utility, being able to do that consistently every turn is not bad. Yep. Agreed. So downsides. Uh, it's expensive. If you take the wizard, it's 275. You know, for, that, for those points, you can almost get a Torlon or some Storm mm -hmm. Drakes. So it has to really get its value. You need to shoot five turns with this thing. Um, it's not particularly durable. It can't get cover or lookout, sir, if, if it's a hero or otherwise. Yep. Uh, it's bravery only 11 six. wounds for up Yep. yep. So even if you put a hero on it, you're not going to be getting a lot of heroic recoveries out of it. And you could mm -hmm. end up hitting yourself with the Searing Beam. So it kind of has to be up front, which makes it vulnerable to any kind of fast or teleport charges. Uh, and it's not durable, like we said, so it's probably going to crumble. All that yeah. said, I think I think it's still a C-tier unit. It's really, yeah. it's got a use, and I think people can make it work in some lists. Mm -hmm. It's not something that immediately sticks out It just can't be behind. What I don't like is like... Like ideally, you want this to be like behind your unit because like it's weird because especially when you watch uh, like lore videos or like I don't know like art of it, it's always like on a hill, but you know that's not really well represented in AOS. Mm -hmm. So like you're still gonna hit your own units if your units are in front of it. So it needs like a clear sort of lane of fire almost. Yeah. Yep. It's uh it's weird that there's no verticality in Age of Sigmar. Well, there sort of is, but not when it comes to something like this. Yeah, not when it comes to like measuring lines and stuff. Yeah. The next up is the Celestial Hurricanum, which, uh, unlike the Luminarch, which gets plus one to unbinding, this thing gets plus one to casting, which is a lot more useful, I would say. It's better to cast mm -hmm. your own spells than deny your opponent's spells. 
especially when you have Dispel Scrolls. Uh, instead of a 6-up ward, it gives plus 1 hit to any cities of Sigmar units nearby, which is good effect if you're bringing cities units. And it gives plus 1 casting to all nearby battle mages, not just itself. So it can do a whole bunch of mortal wounds in a single round. It is more expensive than Luminarch, about 10 points for the non-wizard version, 5 points for the wizard version. Uh, but for 280 points, you'd be paying... You'd get, you'd get a one-spell wizard that can only cast Chain Lightning and the Comet. And it does have the Storm of Shentic shooting ability. So like, this thing can do a lot of mortal wounds in one turn. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think I'd rather have the Luminarch in pretty much any scenario. Really? Can't, yeah. Because this thing can do you know, a fair amount of mortal wounds to one unit, but only within 18 inches. Right, like it spells okay, a short so range. Here's 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 so here's my argument. So I think this is slightly better actually because okay. because with the Luminarch, you have to be extremely careful to not cover up your firing lanes, right? You need you can't have it in the back. It needs to be up front, right? They both have the same kind of survivability, but your enemy can actually avoid the Luminarch's sort of gaze with a bit of careful positioning. It is longer range, so it's tougher to do for sure. But a one mil one millimeter line is not hard to avoid. You know, it, they can sort of just stagger it, everything like an inch between each other, and suddenly you're only hitting maybe one unit with D3 mortal wounds. Well, the good thing is you As can move to... before you shoot, right? Yeah, so this thing you can move, and this thing moves, I think, uh, 10 inches when it's full. Yeah, full. So you have a potential range of like just pointing at something 28 inches away and going, okay, you take three D3 mortal wounds. No, what I'm saying is you can you can change the angle on the Luminar by moving first and then shooting, right? It, it puts you in a weird position, but you can get consistent value out of its mortal wound bomb mm -hmm. every turn. I guess this is more of a single target killer because it's like if if I if I, if my opponent let's say had like a fourteen wound monster and two five wound support heroes and some battle line, I could try and accumulate value for that over two rounds or three rounds. I could just point at like a battle mage and an opposing battle mage or like a five wound support hero yeah. twenty eight inches away and go okay I'll try and delete you this turn. So so the reason I put it in D tier is because Stormcast have no shortage of ways of deleting things. We're very very good at that right now. Would you rather have this this Hurricanum or a squad of Raptors? Oh no, I would definitely have Raptors. In, in fact, yeah. the, one of the main my main gripe with this unit is um, previously it used to have buff hits for order, not just Cities of Sigmar, and that would have been amazing to have in like for two hundred and eighty points in in like a Stormkeeps list because yeah. that's effectively like a Toleron giving you like all out attack all the time or something. This thing would be really and, good. It's really good in the city's army, obviously, right? Because everything gets the plus one hit, and there's a lot more yeah, battle oh, yeah. mages nearby I mean, normally. But in a stormcast there, army, joke. yeah, yeah. The joke is that battle tome cities of Sigmar is really just battle tome celestial Horicon. because it's yeah. the one auto take every city's player takes. Yep. But in a stormcast army, I'm not feeling it. We we have no shortage mm. of ways of killing one thing at a time, and I'd ra like the Luminarch's different. It serves a different role, right? It doesn't compete with Raptors. It competes with the Night Judicator. It competes with Night Vexor competes with the Celestial Prime's Comet. That's a different area. Whereas the Hurricanum, mm -hmm. plus one hit doesn't really matter for us. Plus one casting is okay, but generally doesn't matter because we don't use that many battle mates. You'll have one, maybe. I, don't, I can't see people using more than one in the list. And it won't be this one. It'll be the one I'm putting. Yeah. So you're getting basically a mortal wound cannon. And raptors are a mortal wound cannon. <laughs> you know, they're really good at what they do. Yeah. Would you consider this in a list with no shooting? Like, let's say, I know you said let's not ever do that because you need shooting to make things come to you and Stormcast are a mixed arms force. Let's say I built a Stormkeeps list instead of taking six Raptors for 480 or, I don't know, 10 Judicators for 400. I take one of these instead to put pressure on my opponent and start sniping his support heroes. For sniping support heroes, it's not bad. The fact that it you know gets around Lookout Sirs, it gets around... A lot of armor saves that are that are really tricky. Like if you're playing against another Stormcast, maybe if you specifically yeah. just want to target support heroes, but I don't see it doing that much to help well, you take the, down what, bigger. Well, what targets. I really like it. Well, what I really like it. Like if you do have that Redeemer Castle formation, this thing's Unleash Hell is still three d three mortal wounds potentially because it's a shooting attack. So if you Unleash Hell, you're still going to be three dice on a two up. You take d three mortal wounds. Which you know something charge it's charging you and you want to give it three d three that doesn't seem too bad. I like it. I like the unleash hell on it. Yep, I do like that. It's just uh, hard to think when I would rather have this instead of raptors or or judicators. 
Yeah, and the fact that the the, the battle mage on it, because you do want to take the battle mage on it, it's just it, it just loses a lot of the spell utility because you can't like take any other spell. Like I don't, th- yeah, because I think you can take because it can't learn stormcast spells. It can only learn universal spells, and uh, it has its four scroll spells. The, so. If this thing was two hundred points, I would it would be a very strong consideration. But because a lot of its value is tied up in stuff that doesn't matter for our list, it's just mm-hmm. a mortal wound cannon. I don't think it puts out enough pressure for its current points for our list. Fair. For cities, Fair. armies, this is great. Fair. I mean, so, but think of it this way, right? Like, so, sorry, just to go back, and I, I don't want to harp on this too long. You're getting a battle mage and a mortal wound cannon. Well, it's is, not is a battle that... mage. It's, it's a battle mage that casts chain lightning, which is one of the worst spells that battle mages get. <laughs> Fair, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because Stormcast can cast you know, chain lightning. It's it's our our chain lightning is worse than theirs. It is, I'll but it it's not much worse, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> but this All is right. the worst version of the battle mage. Uh, I would rather have a Gur battle mage who would also get plus one and have a much. Yes, spell. if you could customize the battle mage on it, I think that would increase its value. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, anointed on Frost Phoenix is amazing. Mm-hmm. It is one of the main reasons you want to run Storm Keeps. If you're playing Storm Keeps, you need a strong reason not to bring this guy. He is an absolute cad. The minus one wound aura for anybody within nine inches on melee and shooting is insane. That is an insane effect. It's so strong with Celestial Menagerie. You can just have it in any kind of army. You're playing a, a Gardas Castle. Boom, here's a minus one wound aura. You're playing a whole bunch of Dracoths who normally you know are pretty fragile. Here's a minus one wound aura to fly next to them. This guy is, is incredibly durable. 12 wounds on a usually a three-up save. Not the characteristic, but you know four-up four, four up save with plus one. And a mm-hmm. constant four-up ward. That can't even be shattered by by a slam casting the uh, artifact destruction spell. Just always on for a board. Incredibly fast, sixteen inch flying move. Right, it's a monster, a fast flying monster with a three up save and a good ward. It, it's got all the boxes checked off for what makes a good monster yep. in this edition. Yep. The one downside is that it has bad damage. Right, it does so low damage you can pretty much ignore it. Agreed. Right. So so there's other good things about it. If you take Phoenix Guard, which become a pretty good consideration if you take Phoenix, right? Then he can buff the Phoenix Guard as well. His command ability mm-hmm. to reroll wounds is a very distinct ability in terms of accuracy. There's very few ways to reroll wound rolls these days uh, going forward. He's Bravery 9, which becomes Bravery 10 in a Stormkeep army, which is insane for, for heroic recovery healing. He is Coalition, potentially, which you can take an Arcane Tome and then use Flaming Weapon and get 8 2 damage attacks on the Talents, which bumps him up Three from... Damage attacks. Yeah, they're only Rend 1, but... Uh, yeah, they're Rend 1, 2 damage, but they become Rend 1, 3. And no, no, they're Rend 1, 1 eight. normally. Ice Cold Talons? Yeah. Ice Cold Talons are 2 damage on are base. You, are you sure? I thought, they were, I thought they were 1 damage each. Nope, they're 2. I'm looking at the worst score right now. Okay, even better than... the Great Phoenix Halberd. It's the Rider who does 1 damage. The Talons okay. on the Frost Heart do 2. Okay, I mixed it up. But yeah, 3 damage is, is still huge, right? He, yeah, he goes that's eight from attacks, that potential like twenty four damage. Yeah, he goes from being so meh in damage that you can ignore him into like, oh, this guy is suddenly potentially doing twenty four damage with just the mount. It's only rend one, so it's not going to cut down our Kaon, but it is going to ch- chew through a whole bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can easily give him plus one because, like all the cities of Sigmar units, they can benefit from a Toralon. You don't have to waste all out attack on this guy. You can just passively buff him with a Toralon nearby and yep, move your army up. And, what uh, I yeah. love is, yeah, what I really love is he can, because it's two inch reach, he can even like be directly behind some liberators and just be swinging over them or some Phoenix guard. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, the, the downside is that he does need wizards to function, so you're constraining your list in that way. I, that's why I really like the Arcane Tome on him. It makes him a lot more versatile. Flaming Weapon casts on a four. That's almost mm-hmm. guaranteed. It's it's really close to being one of the most reliable spells in the game. It's, it's like... Uh, yeah, that's insane how easy it is to cast. And every time anybody casts a spell, he's now on a three-up save. Beautiful. The synergy, right? It's so good. Oh, yeah, it's 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 like everything. It, it, this, weirdly enough, is doing everything Stormcast wants to be doing. Yep. Like, just a tough, durable guy that can dish out some punishment if you ignore him. Yeah. He's not a high priority. Like, your, your opponent wants to kill him, but he's really hard to kill. You can't ignore him either, because the... The extra damage from flaming weapon, it's really strong. Mm-hmm. And really plus, strong like, if your opponent wants to charge you, that minus one to wound. Like we discussed, how good that uh, celestial menagerie trait was because there aren't that many wound buffs in the game, and minus one to wound will act absolutely cut down people's uh, offensive output in this yep. game. So downsides: 
uh, he kind of constrains your list in a way, right? Like you want to play Storm Keeps because uh, the damage is a serious consideration. Without Flaming Weapon, his damage is not impressive. So I think you really want to play Coalition and you really want to give him an Arcane Tome. So you have to play a list that either has extra artifacts or you don't care about giving the Arcane Tome to him. Like Let's say you're playing a really aggressive list where you don't even give the Mirror Shield to the Relictor. Uh, you're just teleporting stuff forward and moving everything up, right? Like it, it constrains your list in that way. He needs Wizards. I would probably run at least one more Wizard nearby just in case Flaming Weapon does fail. You'd have a second chance of getting the 3-up save. Yep. And uh, you probably don't want to run him in a Drake list because the minus one wound aura that he gives is marginalized by the, the trait. Like, they already get minus one to wound. You don't really need a second one. Uh, because he's so expensive, you know, 315 points is, is pricey, right? That's a big chunk of your list. Yeah, yeah. He's, he costs yeah. about as much as Celestin Prime. He does way more than Celestin Prime for the points. Um, yeah, yeah, which is strange. <laughs> <laughs> uh, part of his value is tied into his command ability to reroll wounds. So you're not getting the most out of him unless you bring Phoenix Guard. I don't think you need to bring Phoenix Guard to make this a useful model. I think it's more, uh, he's so good that now suddenly Phoenix Guard are a serious consideration. Yep. So yeah, Anointed Oath Frostheart Phoenix is an S-tier unit for Stormcast Armies. It's a lot better than a lot of our units. Yeah, this is the one I'm actually excited to try out, at least until like Dawn of the Crusades come, come on. Yeah. It's been in my shopping cart on the Games Workshop website for about two years. I keep I kept waffling back and forth, and I'm still not pulling the trigger because I don't want his War Scroll to get pulled out from, you know, I don't want the rug pulled out from under me in the new book oh, that, yeah. that might be coming. So mm -hmm. I'm so close to getting one. If I build a list that I really like the look of, I think I will get one. Sounds good, yeah. Uh, we didn't mention the Fire Phoenix in this video, and the reason for that is that the reviving yourself is just not that useful. Stormcast don't need. Also happens on a four up, like yeah, it's a half a chance to do that, and I don't, I don't think that's reliable enough. Yeah, the minus one wound aura is so much better. It's immediate, it's constant, it can't be shut off. Um, the durability actually makes sense because your opponent wants to target this thing down, and then you have this incredible durability that's keeping it alive. Whereas the mm -hmm. frost Fe or the fire phoenix is just a, a fast punchy monster, and Stormcast have more than enough sources. We can take two. Yeah, storm I think, yeah. The the fire phoenix is basically like a better gyro bomber because it does. I think two up on a two up, it does five mortal wounds over something. Anything that part it passes across. And we're not full, we're not uh, hurting for ways to fly. Yeah, we're not hurting for ways yeah. to really do that. Yeah. So. So we didn't bother mentioning the, the fire phoenix. Um, it would have been an F tier unit, I think, in our estimation. So it wasn't worth mentioning. But the frost phoenix is dope. Agreed. And speaking of that, here's the phoenix guard, which are. You know, 175 points for 20 wounds mm -hmm. on a 4-up save and a 4-up ward. <laughs> now, the 4-up ward, like I said, it's basically doubling their wounds, so instead of 10 yeah. wounds, you get 20. 20 wounds for 175 points is one of the better ratios that you can get in a Stormcast army. Um, you know, uh, And it's not tied to, like, a cheap garbage unit. Like, uh, like yeah, no, they're a very good unit, yeah. Yeah. They have not the best melee attacks, but they have competent melee attacks, right? Two attacks apiece, they're on small bases... It's not nothing. <laughs> there. Yeah, I mean, you're two inch reach. It's basically like, it's like everyone has a liberator, uh, not a hammer and shield, basically. Mm -hmm. They they get a passive plus one to charge rolls, which is nice considering they're very slow. They can't run in charge, so plus one to charge is okay. They're a really really good unit to revive with life swarm because each guy you revive is effectively reviving two wounds with the guys. Yep. And, and it's uh, easier to do that because it's their one wound only. So. Yeah. So they're they're just a good. Anvil, right? If you need a, a durable block that can move and hold space for a little while, you can maybe put some resurrection into with the life swarm. I think the Phoenix Guard, uh, given how good the, the Frost Phoenix is, the fact that you can command and buff all of them at the same time, yeah, I think they're a C tier unit. Not the best damage, but they're a pretty good anvil. A slow mm -hmm. booming anvil, but good one nonetheless yeah. they do sort of necessitate taking a lord with them to get the most out of them but... yeah and unfortunately uh you can't do that as allies it has to be coalition because allies mm -hmm. are 400 point limit. so you'd go over that it has to be you could take one as coalition and one as allies that would be fine yeah i would take this as ally because i really want to give the tome to the other guy yeah you don't need the bravery bonus so yeah you could do the these guys as allies and cross phoenix as a coalition unit they're fine if you have Phoenix Guard, I think you, you could enjoy using them. 
And next up, the Shadow Warriors are... The good things about them is that they can just deep strike all the time. So if you're playing Storm Keeps, you don't have Scions of the Storm, but you still want a unit that can deep strike and, and take uh, objectives later on in the game, there you go. Here's a nice cheap one that can do it. Uh, 10 bodies for 120 points. They get plus one, plus one in cover, so they're fairly accurate. You know? Yeah. What more is there to say? Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're just cheap. Like, for cheap bodies, I think 120 is a really good rate, especially because, like, our, we don't have really good shooters. My only problem with this is, like, their shooting is really weak. Not only is it, you know, it really it's really reliant on them being in cover all the time, but it's only minus one rend. There's no more wounds. Um, I think it's only one attack. It's one shot. If it was two shots, I would at least be like, okay, that's that's something. Um, yeah, they're not as useful as they were in second edition. But for cheap bodies that you just want to have in strong keys as like a backfield threat, uh, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now they they pretty much have to go and cover to do anything useful in terms of defense or offense, which really restricts where they can pop out given the the nine inch exclusion zone. So they're harder to use than it seems. You don't want to just drop them in the middle of, of nowhere because then they won't do much damage. Yeah, they're fine. If you need a, a deep strike unit, there's even other choices that we'll we'll talk about later. So I will say though, uh, some lists I know like really like deploying a uh, deep strike unit right in front of your opponent's army to sort of just block them in with lots of bodies. Canine Shadow Stoppers do this or like did this while Daughters of Kane could still be allied into Stormcast. And they were really good at it because they have a native minus one to hit. Yep. Um, so. Yeah. So. Yeah. This is fine. There's other units on this list that do something similar. What sets the Shadow Warriors apart is that they're ten bodies, whereas the other ones are, I think, Chameleon Skinks are on here. They're five bodies. Three Revenants are also mm -hmm. five bodies. So, yeah, Shadow mm -hmm. Warriors. And if you need ten bodies to dump on an objective at some point, here you go. C might be generous. They might be C minus D plus. That I think they might be D. I think yeah. they might be D. Yeah. It, it it is a situational useful unit. It's not like it's you know, never used. Right. Let's talk about the Iron Drakes. Uh, so they are very efficient shooting if they don't move. You get 18 shots mm -hmm. for 160 points, and then two torpedo shots, which are Ren 2 and D6 damage monsters. So that's good. That's a good thing, especially, yeah, that's right. especially if you improve their Rend with a Rune Lord. Bringing a Rune Lord, these guys become more viable. Uh, they have a pretty good Unleash Helm, just given the fact that you don't have to move in your opponent's face, so you always have the bonus active on their face, so they double up their shots for Unleash Hell always, and they are surprisingly efficient to revive with the Life Storm because their their shooting is, is not bad. And they have free up yeah. save against shooting, which means against counter shooting they can take some shots. Uh, yeah. But in order to get the bonus on your turn, they can't move. And they're only 4-inch move, and they're only 16-inch range. So, right. So, so the way that people have been using them is it pretty like taking Iron Drakes without a Soul Screen Bridge in your army is pretty much like against the law, I think, uh, because the value just goes down so much if they have to move. But if you do have the points to sort of take that, um, these can sort of protect your castle from uh, as it's like slowly moving up the board, like your Redeemer castle. Um, the only problem is again, like our, it's just that what shooter, what unit would you not take instead of this? And the answer is. It's very hard to answer that because our shooters have really efficient statistics now. Yeah. Stormcast shooting units can fill this exact same role, either adjudicators or raptors, and they just do it better, more efficiently with more utility on, on range. Uh, like bow adjudicators mm -hmm. and raptors can strike out way further away. Uh, these guys are a counter shooting unit in a castle, which mm -hmm. we don't really need. You know, we have an offensive shooting unit that sits behind a castle. So. Don't yeah. really have the, the a problem. Pro yeah, the problem is it'll do really good against like some melee armies. Like it's not a bad strategy to have. Like just have like a redeemer castle and then have some like twenty iron drakes sitting in the middle of, with a rune lord just unleashing shots into people while you slowly move up when you have to. That's that's not a bad strategy. The problem is if you face a strong cast list that has thirty inch range on you, or if you face a luminet list that has thirty inch range on you, you're gonna lose that battle. Yeah, yeah. If you're playing a castle formation, you want to be able to force the opponent to come to you regardless of what their list is. Uh, you, you have to be able to force it. So for that reason, Raptors are, are the kings in that effect because 30-inch range, not much uh, competes with that. So Yeah, Great. these guys are yep. uh, D tier, unfortunately. They they would be really good in a lot of other armies for the exact same role. It's just that Stormcast have much better options for the exact same points that we can spend on these guys. Mm -hmm. And all right, I'll, I'll let you take this one. I want you to make the case for her. So we just talked about how 
arm drakes aren't good because the range is you know something to be desired, something left to be desired. Duralia Van Denst is a hero for 115. She's not a leader, so she doesn't break that pitch battle limit. She can go into Huntress of Heartland Battalion, although I don't know why you would want that. There's been a lot of times in my Swancast army building where I have everything I want, but I have 115 points or some odd points like that left over. And I could take another Liberator unit or you know, start upgrading my Liberators to Vindictors or whatever. But actually, I found that Duralia Van Denst is not a bad hero to have 115. She's got two attacks at 24 inches at twos and threes if she doesn't move, and then ran minus two, two damage. And if that damage goes to four against wizards and demons. And there's a lot of like really good wizards, especially like a lot of hero monsters that are wizards now. Um, and I'm not sure, does Arcane Tome turn you into a wizard or does it yes. give you that keyword? Yeah. Okay, great. So and then people sure. are really using that artifact. So being able to sort of just have that value from 24 inches away with minus two rend four damage is going to scare a lot of people. As an added bonus, if you don't have really good targets for her and your opponent is heavy on handless spells, you can start attacking those and she gets a 2d6 unbind instead of shooting. Or she can actually go and charge an endless spell, funnily enough. She can actually go fight it with her sword, which is not bad. Um, I think for 115 points, if you're like, I don't know what to take and I don't want to upgrade my Liberator Seven Dictors and I don't want to take a Liberator unit, I think she's fine. I think sometimes she might provide more value than a, taking another Liberator unit. That's so, my case for her. So situationally useful. That's why I, I grade her at C. That's potentially eight damage against, you know, a wizard or demon. There are mm -hmm. a lot of small support wizards in the game. They're getting phased out. I think, uh, like even Iron Jaws have stopped using their their little small hero that has the mm -hmm. spell because they can just give an arcane tome to one of their cabbages. And uh, eight damage potentially a turn for 115 points, and it is fairly accurate at twos and threes. I, I see it. I see it as worth it. Because um, even like think about you facing a Luminat army, like everything's a wizard. It's just being able to unleash minus two rent like eight damage at them with a hundred and fifteen point character. It's really good. And can, the thing uh, is, she's survivable. Like she. The thing is, like most heroes at her point level. Like if you look at the battle mage, who's like a six up save and no ward, she's a four up save, five wounds, five up ward save natively. That she's tough. She's a tough cookie. She's not gonna die to just some light shooting breeze. Sorry, you said six wounds. She's like, I think she's five wounds, five, five okay. or six wounds. Um, let me just quickly double check that. Five wounds. She has a four up save natively and a five up ward save natively, which is really good. So, you know, she's not exactly like easy to just, you know, sneeze away like a battle mage is. I can see her as a gap filler. I think if you use her, you won't, you won't be disappointed. I don't think there's ever, I don't think there's going to be a list that doesn't have wizards or demons. Even Caradron are, are starting to use the arcane tome, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's really almost impossible to face somebody that doesn't have a wizard or demon. If you, you really want her shooting them, which means you might put her in really bad positions to do that, and the fact that she needs to remain stationary to double her shots and get plus one hit. I think 24 inches makes it... 24 inches on a shorter board like we have in Age of Sigmar now makes it much easier. Um, I actually tried a Stormkeep's list over the weekend with Judicators. And 24 inches never feels like, you know, I really, really need to translocate or anything like that. It, it feels doable most of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you made a pretty good case for her. I'm not totally sold on it, but I, you, you've piqued my interest enough that I would want to try yeah, if she Yeah, no, if she was 145 or something, like, no, I would not have taken her. Yeah. Like, uh, I think her, like, yeah, I think she's at that point level where she's just, you can just, like, slot her in if you have 115 points. Because yeah. at 145, 150, you're like, I I'll just take another Night Encanter or something. Hmm. Yeah, I can see it. I, I don't think the attacking in the spell thing is going to come up very often. Oh, no, not at all. And, but, and her father, by the way, don't take her father. He's terrible. Like, yeah, he's like a melee <laughs> version of her. And it's much worse. He's like a melee version, yeah. But he he's six attacks, threes and threes, minus one, one damage with his big sword. But then he really only wants to be fighting wizards and demons, so... I'm really glad you can take them separately and they're costed competitively. Oh, yeah, yeah. If this was a warband kind of situation, I wouldn't have taken them yeah. at all. Yeah, okay. I think I'd give her a try at some point. I'd have to find 115 points in a list somewhere. She doesn't really need to be a coalition unit because she can't take artifacts anyway, so you can yeah, put her in Scion's list. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think I'd give her a try. All right. Uh, so any closing thoughts about the Cities of Sigmar units before we move on to the rest of the video?
JJ, you've been pretty quiet this whole time. What are you thinking? I, yeah, just following around, along here. Not much exposure to City of Sigmar, so I can't really comment on it much. Um, yeah, I really hope the Dawnbringer Crusade brings some interesting updates yeah. because, um, yeah, everything just seems like uh, it's, we're looking at more skills that were brought over from Warhammer Fantasy. Exactly. Know? The one thing I will say is that with Duralia, and I hate to meme, but it just seems like they did canter with extra steps, right? <laughs> Um, no, I would say, so, so that's what I said, right? If she was 10 points more, I'd probably take a Knight in Canter, but I could legitimately see taking her, slotting in her at 115 points over a Battle Mage in some lists. Yeah. Yeah, like, think of it as, like, you're adding two more, or, like, uh, two shots at minus two or two damage, or minus two or four damage, potentially four to eight damage in your army for 115 points. Mm-hmm. I think I'd do that in a lot of times. Can we bump her down to D tier just because of the questionable paint job that the heavy metal team does on, on women's faces for some reason? <laughs> sure. I don't know how you'd paint her. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm terrible at painting faces, but uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think their heavy contrast does not go well on uh, yeah. female faces. I'll put it that way. It makes them look very grotesque and like weird lighting or whatever. Like statues come to life. Mm-hmm. Like go look at the Drakari and Sisters of Battle faces. Good lord, they look yeah. they look bad. All right, moving into the next section here is a uh, just a compilation of Dwarden units. So this is Caradron Overlords, Fire Slayers, and that's it really, because everything else is in Cities of Sigmar. So let's jump into it. Uh, first up is the Grimwrath Berserker, which is again is a hero that's not a leader like Duralia. Uh, you can put him in Hunters of the Heartland. He's cheap, 120 points, and the reason I I, I like including him just as an interesting thing, is because you've got a new War Scroll in Broken Realms uh, where you choose an oath at the start of the first battle round, which is, you know, has a lot of versatility. If you bring mm-hmm. him as an ally, you know, he's got different oaths. One of them is like you get plus one, plus one if you're fighting a priest or plus one, plus one if you're near a bodyguard unit or something like that. But one of the ones that's really fun is if you bring him as an ally, he just always has plus one, plus one all the time. Mm-hmm. Or you yeah. can make him run in charge or you can give him a, a somewhat decent ward. Mm-hmm. So he's which it which isn't bad because he's six wounds on a four up save. So a six wounds, four up save, and five up if he's in combat range is is pretty decent. Not nearly as good as he used to be. I actually prefer well, the yeah. old war scroll a lot compared to this one. How come? Well, How he come? was a lot more durable, right? Was he? I think so. I think his old war scroll he he had a better ward. Maybe I'm thinking of first edition. Um, I don't think so. I think well, okay, okay. I think you are thinking of first edition. I think. Well, I guess I guess you're thinking of second edition before they uh, changed it in Broken Realms. I think is the better maybe. I don't even remember. Yeah, it's been I too think... many. He's, he's had three War Scrolls in like three years. So uh, mm-hmm. anyway, so he he can be four attacks at at twos and twos, ren two two damage, and total immunity to rampages because you can stick him in hunter. So he could be this nice little monster cleaver, uh, mm-hmm. but you know he's slow as heck. <laughs> if you have the plus one plus he one, he, he really yeah he really needs yeah if he really needs a run and charge or yeah he that plus if you take the plus one plus one he's gonna be he's gonna basically gonna be running all the time yeah so not charging he as an ally not a, you know, everything we talk about going forward cannot be coalition this is all allies which means no traits and artifacts and uh, do we really need to spend 120 points on a four inch move he's basically a paladin right like four attacks. Twos and twos, rent two two damage. He's a, so, he's a retributor that doesn't do mortals. So I noticed this isn't on the slide, but he does have a caveat on two up. He fights again at the end of the combat phase. Isn't that one of his? And own? no, it is. It is okay. part of his war scroll. It, that, okay. That's actually so. So when you were saying the old, so I actually looked at the old war scroll because I have the book. Um, he just had a five up ward save. That was that wasn't an oath. That was always part of his war scroll. Instead, they gave you they removed that and they essentially gave it to you as an oath Mm -hmm. but what he's always had is the two-up fight again and then the fight when he dies Uh, does he do the two-up fight again now Mm -hmm. he does not when he dies just period all the time he double fights yeah yeah. at the end of combat at the end of combat if he's within combat range on a two-up he fights again okay so let's say potentially eight attack at two-up two-up run two damage that's still not as good as just bringing paladin yeah that's uh two paladins worth and yeah for just uh, what 235 so like 100 115 more points yeah yeah so unfortunately as fun as this war scroll is to use if you use it you're not going to be disappointed he's not bad by any means but 
he doesn't really give Stormcast anything they don't already have access to. We already have a bunch of four-inch move units that we can teleport around and we can buff up easier. This guy doesn't do much for us. Yeah, I think he's, yeah, I think, I think because he doesn't have that same instant value because he's so slow and you need to get him into combat, he falls in the same category as Duralia, but where Duralia can sort of just produce value from 24 inches away, he really needs to be up close. So I think yep. D-tier is fair for him. Yep. It's like if you don't have 120 points and you don't know what to do with it, and you don't want to take like a Night Herald or something, take him. For, for the same reason you don't want to use Duralia's dad, you don't want to use a Grimrath, mm-hmm. but he is, I would say he's better than a Grim, or, uh, than, Dur- than his Galen. Galen oh, yeah, yeah. Story. yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the one thing I don't like, though, is like he has to, so his thing is... Um, his fight when you die, you can't fight three times. Like if you fought twice using his uh, end of combat phase ability, eight attacks thing, then he doesn't fight when you die. So that that's the bummer. Mm-hmm. Also, if you if you slay this model in the shooting phase, uh, it does not fight when it dies. It has to be slain in the combat phase for it to do that. Yeah, and he's pretty easy to kill in the shooting phase. Mm-hmm. Four up save. Yeah, he's he's not going to get his great ward save if you don't take the out. So yeah, right on. Uh, next up is the much better version of the exact same model, basically. This is uh, everything the Grimrath, everything bad about the Grimrath is also bad about Gotrick. He's he's still slow. Uh, he's still only forage move. He's just going to walk up the board, but he's just so much punchier. It's insane. Um, yeah. If people aren't aware, Gotrick is a killing machine. He fights twice all the time. He does insane damage. He fully rerolls hits and wounds. He does D6 mortal wounds on any hit roll of six. Um, he's also not a leader, so he can go in Hunters of the Heartland. So now you have an actual super killy unit that can't be roared, it can't be stomped for those mortal wounds. Yep. And it's also <laughs> yeah. insanely durable on top of all that, because all damage yeah. done to Gotrick is reduced down to one. So if you did that uh, is six damage attack, yeah, if yeah. you're fighting a Spirit of Durthu and he hits you with a sword that does six damage, you say no, it did one damage. And then yep. on top of that, he has a three-up ward. Yep. So on average, you need 24 packets of one damage to kill Gotrick, and you better hope you do it before he can do heroic recovery. Oh, yeah. He's super easy to heroic recovery, too. I think he's bravery... I think he's bravery 9 or 10? Or 10. Yeah, he's bravery 10. Yep. So, compared to, let's say, four Fulminators, which are 460 points, and those are like the gold standard of doing damage, he's about as durable, effectively 24 wounds, but he heals himself, right? So, Mm -hmm. he's good. He's an efficiently costed Super beat stick. Like he makes Celestin Prime look like a bitch. Oh yeah, like oh good lord. Yeah, I can't believe he's four thirty five points this edition. Yeah. Uh, so um, downsides. One, there's not yep, many. Slow. There's not many. He's just slow. That's it. And yeah. If you, if you and fight a bunch the of uh... berserker. Yeah, it's like I think you can't deep strike the Grimrat berserker with if you ally in a rune spider. You shouldn't. It's, that's a really bad idea. But you can't even do that with Gotrek. Yeah, so so despite all that gushing, why why is he only B tier? Well, because Stormcast have really good units that do a lot of damage at similar point values. In the previous book, he would have been an S tier unit, but in in the new Stormcast book, we just have really good units that can do a lot of damage. We don't need him anymore. It's, mm. it's marginal. He is really good at what he does, but we just have a lot of things that do something very similar. So let me ask you this. Would you consider him in a list with Stormkeeps as a counterpuncher unit if you take a battle mage that gives him wild form? No. And here's why. He doesn't take up enough space. If you're spending mm-hmm. 435 points and you're, not, and you're not taking up a certain amount of area on the board, you're going to be really limit, limited strategically in how much space you can deny your opponent. Like Nothing will ever get close to Gotrick, uh, but they can just run past him. Yeah, they can that, charge past him. He, they can just avoid that sort of twelve-inch corridor that he creates. Right. You're basically losing them. two or three screens in order to bring him, or you're losing the space that four fulminators would take up. And space is everything in the sigma. The game is won by movement and just being on the board. In my in my opinion, the only reason you do damage to each other is so that you can control the part of the board that they used to be on. That's a, that's an interesting way to look at it, and we'll talk more about it in our tactics video next week. Yeah. but. Yeah, that's I, I really that I just wanted to you know to present that argument because he seems quite effective as a counterpuncher and he's a great fighter. There's no doubt about it. He basically carves wherever he goes, he will carve a ten to fourteen inch corridor around himself that your enemy has to avoid or they'll get wrecked. Oh yeah. If your you got- if your opponents are if your opponents are bad to where they don't avoid him, you will just wreck them. You gotta hand. respect Godric. You can't go anywhere within his threat range. He will murder everything he hits. 
unless you hit him first with 10 protectors. Then he can then he can die. Yeah, that, that's perhaps one of the only things too, because even Gargans like won't kill him. They won't do yep. anything to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um with regards to your question about a counterpunch unit, picture the amount of space taken up by 10 protectors versus the amount of space taken up by Gotrick. Yeah. Just the physical space taken up, right? It's a huge difference. He's on a small 32 mil base, whereas you get 10 40 mil bases. Mm-hmm. Last Warden unit we are talking about here is the Grunstock Gun Hauler. I am a big fan of this unit. I liked it so much that I even put it in one of my initial lists for Stormcast. Because it is very similar to our Ballista, except it's it's got a little bit less rend, but it can teleport every single turn. And that is really, really cool. Have a teleporting cannon just zipping around the board, shooting off rend 2d6 shots, or you know, you take the drill cannon and try to do some mortal wounds. I, I like it. I like it a lot. And if, if I could fit more than one in my list reasonably i would uh, my initial version of that list i put in our list video actually had two of these things flying around but it got yeah it's a pretty tight. pretty good cost as well because at 155 gaining all that movement like the ability to move 12 and also teleport or oh, sorry not not in the same time but either 12 inch move or teleport if you'd like it's just so good for artillery piece essentially because mm-hmm. that's what it is yeah it's just you, like oh you have to compare it to a ballista and like for 15 more points you give up one rent but you get so much out of it one of the main downsides of the Ballista is that once you engage it in melee, that's it. It's done. It's never getting away from that combat. It can't even retreat out of that combat now because with a three-inch move, you you may, like if you get even halfway surrounded, you're not getting more than three inches away from an enemy. So that Ballista is just gone as soon as anything gets in melee with it. Whereas this guy just teleports away. He's fine. He's going to keep doing his job. Yeah, and can, you know, to support his, his combat isn't great, but uh, being able to drop a bomb rack on a four-up do some mortal wounds isn't, isn't bad yeah like ballistas can't do that <laughs> yeah you know you can cycle the storm ballistas but you can't uh can't cycle these guys so it's it's if you make the comparison to a ballista this thing looks pretty good i would put it in the b tier uh even though it can't benefit from any allegiance and, and it's only useful if you have you know heavy artillery if you're running a lord it doesn't ordinator. need it doesn't need to right yeah you just take a lord ordinator like if you're taking artillery this should be you should be considering this unit as a yep. two of or a one of if you've ever used a ballista, just think, what if my ballista could teleport and you've got the gun hauler? That's got a decent sized base, so you can deny some space with it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it counts as two models on objectives. That's true. Okay, next up, we are talking about the elves. 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 These are elves. Yeah, they are. First up, this is one I really like talking about. I think a lot of people don't recognize how strong it is. The Akelian Alopex. I think I pronounced Akelian correctly. I'm sure I didn't have to <laughs> correct me about that. Um, the main reason I like <laughs> this the guy... the shark, man. <laughs> the main reason I like this guy is uh, the points and its unique effect. So 125 points means you get two of these guys for 250. And if you compare that to our Dracoths, that is you know, shockingly similar because they have the same mount attack. Reason 3 is rent to 2 damage. It also has a second attack, six six attacks at threes and threes. So it's not it's not a slouch in melee by any means. Uh, but yeah. instead of our really powerful fulminator glaives or our tempester shooting, what you give up is it, you give that up. But what you get is a is a net launcher, which prevents pile in moves if you get hit by it. You don't have to be wounded by it, just hit by it, which is an incredibly powerful ability. Not just defensively when you're using unleash hell, but if you're offensive and you and you're fighting a large unit. You know, two two uh, two ranks deep, and let's say ten models wide. Like your opponent has a big reinforced unit, and yeah, what you do is you hit it on the flank with a with a hammer unit, and you shoot it with a net so it can't it can't counter pilot. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's an it's, it's, it's really it's, strong. Yeah, that's an incredible ability. Yeah, yeah, and it's not just that, but it's like let's say your opponent groups multiple units close by to where let's say you want to drop grand hammer annihilators into something but you're afraid that once you kill that unit, the unit that's right next to it will pile in and fight, just net them, and now they can't do that. Exactly, yep. The, a very common strategy uh, as you as you get into higher levels of play is people will have counterattack units within three inches of their front line so that if you charge their front line, you'll kill the screen, and immediately you'll get counterattacked by, by a good hammer unit. Stormcast do this all the time, especially with uh, protectors and their glaives, three-inch range. They love doing mm-hmm. that. Uh, but if you hit them with a net, that strategy doesn't work anymore. Sorry. So it's really yeah, good it's... on the offense and on the defense. Um, there's there's honestly nothing funnier in the game than getting charged by a unit of 
you know, 10 to 30 models and you hit it with a net on the way in and then it's just stuck there exactly where it charges. None of the models get to pile in. It's great. It's a really strong ability. Um, problem is, you know, you probably want to bring two of these guys. So that's 250 yeah. points carved out of your list. Uh, they're not... Yeah, particular. the net launcher only has one attack, so you yeah. could fail it because it's not a three-up. And it's not Hell's really ball. worth using Unleash Hell. Like if strategically, if, or sorry, not Unleash Hell, uh, All Out Attack, if you really want to mm -hmm. ensure that it goes off, you bring two of these guys and you use uh, uh, All Out Attack. That's a lot of investment, but yeah. nothing else offers this effect this reliably. So it, it's it's a good niche that it's carved out for itself. Also, they're fast. Like a yep. 14 inch move and the net launcher's 18 inch range. So you're getting like 32 inch threat ranges on a flying unit, no less. Yep. So it's pretty and, good. And they're flying, so they can jump over initial screens. Like yep. the, the, these guys are, are great. If you wanted an excuse to use the Alapex, um, I'm here to tell you that you got one. You can make a list that benefits these guys quite well. Now, they don't get the Ident Tides ability, so they don't get to fight first. They don't get to reroll. They don't do any of that. Um, and the biggest downside, obviously, is that stopping pylon doesn't really mean much in a, in a monster meta. A single mm -hmm. model not being able to pylon is, is almost meaningless. It specifically has to be things that want to you know, charge kill something, and then fight twice. And it works yeah. against that, but I wouldn't spend points to stop that. I would rather spend points to just put another... Okay. So unfortunately right now, the Alifex is not seeing the right kind of meta, but as soon as the game shifts back into you know 60 Stabas or 15 Hearts... 60 Hearts Witch Elves. <laughs> or, or yeah, two, two blocks of 30 Witch Elves. As soon as it goes back to that, and it will, it yeah. definitely will. The monster meta won't last forever. And as soon as we go back to that, the Alifex is, is going to be there waiting. Absolutely. No, I, this is a good unit. It just it just needs the right meta to function. Like, if you're looking for allies, this is not the worst purchase. All right, next up, continuing the Eidoneth, uh, we're going to look at both Eidolons. We're going to look at the aspect of the storm first. So what are good things about this? It's a 12-inch flying move that's quite durable. He, he's a durable, fast flying beat stick. 12 mm -hmm. wounds, 3 up save, 5 up ward. These are beautiful stats. You would love to see this on all kinds of units. And Bravery 10, so it can heal itself. Punchy, you know, it can potentially do 10 damage um, just normally, but it gets 50% more damage on the charge, so 15 damage on the charge. It can retreat and charge, so it can't be tied down. I mean, it's like a Celestine Prime without the minus 3 rent on the yeah. charge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite like, similar. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good. Yep, and if he's fighting <laughs> a hero... It's, 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 yeah, it's a, it retreats and charges, so it's pretty much always getting that off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you know, it, it's unique. Can't take more than one. I don't think you'd ever want to, and I don't think you can with ally limits. Uh, but it is worth mentioning that unique stuff you can't take more than once. Uh, it is expensive, 330 points. And as I said, it's a fast flying durable beat stick. But Stormcast have plenty of those. We we have too many of those right now. Yes. Um, between Andrasta and Prime and and the two big dragons yeah. and, and Bastion. We have a lot of things that just for around 300 points move forward and hit stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, oh, I th uh, yeah, the thing that I really want to mention is like the 12 wounds, three up save, five up ward. Um, it's not a like, so I actually started using this guy at end of second edition as a beat stick because our beat sticks are just horrible outside of evocators. Um, but yeah, given that now we have like four up ward save beat sticks at you know, single single model beat sticks that is at that point level, um, he's fallen a bit in value, but he's still yeah. good. If you have him, you can play him, is what I'm saying. He's definitely playable. Yeah, I put him in D tier just because Stormcast have other units at those same points. Uh, but mm -hmm. he's he's not that much worse than using a Celestine Prime. He has some advantages over him being able to retreat and charge, always having five attacks instead of having to wait for it. There's advantages yeah, to using in, this guy. He has, a, he has a built in healing because every time he charges, he heals D3. Yeah, the, um, the charging, healing after charging is probably the worst time to heal in this game. Yeah, <laughs> I can't think. I of mean, the, worst the fact time. that he retreats. Okay, so so the fact that he retreats and charges, it's not that bad because it means like, okay, he goes into combat, he gets damage, he retreats and charges. You couple that with heroic recovery because he has bravery ten, and suddenly you know you can heal two through each turn. Yeah, so but most it's most not of a, the time, kind of, yeah, most of the time, the first time you charge, you're not gonna heal anything, so that gets wasted. Yeah, and then you might just yeah. die before you have a chance to heal again. So uh, it's three up, say five reward. It's tough, but it could happen. You're right. Yeah. Well, and then the all-out attack, the automatic all-out attack whenever it fights a hero at the start of combat. I mean, you're just saving CP on it, which is, yeah. I think that's pretty great. Yeah, so so his, uh, a big thing, a big reason for this guy's point cost is because of his aura. He was plus one to wound mm -hmm. rolls for all nearby Ideneth. If you bring this guy, you don't have any points to bring any other Ideneth. 
So that gets totally yeah. Insane. And this guy wounds on twos on pretty much everything, mm -hmm. so it's pretty pointless. Yeah. So. As opposed to the aspect of the sea, which has some stuff that we might be interested in. Uh, the storm aspect is not a priest. It's not a wizard. It's it's just a beat stick. Whereas the aspect of the sea is a wizard. Uh, in fact, he is a two spell wizard who can reroll casting, unbinding, and dispels. And he's also bravery ten with a plus three aura, which means he's always healing himself with heroic recovery because he's at thirteen bravery, mm -hmm. which is great. He has the same defensive profile as the aspect of the storm, uh, but with a lot more utility. If you want to get off mystic shield and endless spells, this guy is a really good choice for that sort of thing. And his signature yeah. spell is quite good as well, right? Twelve inch range, D six enemy units, not just one enemy unit, but potentially yeah, it's like a, almost like an aura. Yeah. Even if it was just one enemy unit, that's a you know a minus one hit spell. Sure, twelve inches isn't the best, but the fact that it's D six enemy unit is huge. And he's not terrible in melee. He's got okay attacks, right? So this I mean, guy's... his his main thing is he he offsets the melee thing with his shooting because he has D three shooting attacks at threes and threes minus two two damage at fifteen inches, which sort of offsets. It doesn't fully offset the aspect of the storm's three damage on the charge, but it's something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this guy just has a lot more utility. You don't have to just run him forward and hit stuff, which, as we said, there's other units in our army that fill that same role. This guy is more... He's like a cheaper Krondis, I would say. Yeah. He's, he's a good wizard. But he's... Uh, man, is he expensive. 355. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a big chunk of your army. And if, you know, if you're using him to get off an endless spell, you're also paying for the endless spell, whereas what we could do instead is just take a cheap Lord Arcanum and have them cast the endless spell with the rerollable trait. So... Yeah. He is, I would say he's better than the aspect of the storm in a lot of our lists, but I'm I'm having trouble figuring out when exactly I would want to use him. Uh, he does a lot of good things, but I just I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. mean he's bad. I quite like him, and he, he's definitely a C tier unit. He has some situational use. Um, yeah. C elf is a C tier. <laughs> uh, the C word. Ah, uh, aspect of the C. See you too. Good one. All right. Next up on our AAL, uh, we have the Venari Shardstar Ballista, which right off the bat, I'm going to point out this is not a war machine. Yeah, it's like what? What? what yeah, there was, it was. It was like this was done. This is anti stormcast bias. That's what this is. There's no reason for it not to have the war machine. The <laughs> only reason is because Lord Ordinator exists. Yep. They didn't want him allying that in. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's and and frankly, we wouldn't because. Our ballistas are better, I think. Better. Yeah, I think. Yeah, because it's D3 damage. No, but okay, so it's two attacks at D3 damage versus one attack at D6. But you lose out on a point of rent, so like with this one. So what's the what's the the dealio on that? Yeah, it, it's potentially if you're if you remain stationary, it's three shots at rent two D3 versus mm -hmm. one shot rent three D6. So it spikes higher with less rend, less accuracy, because it's winning on threes instead of twos. Um, yeah, it's it's comparable to our ballista. And what puts it over the edge is that it's only five wounds with a five up safe, so it's way squishier than our ballistas. Oh yeah, it'll die to any counter. Yeah, fire. yeah, it has that dazzling bolt for minus one hit, which is a nice ability. Uh, but the problem is, our ballistas are just better than this thing, right? And our ballistas aren't aren't the hottest units right now. Yeah, the the, the thing is like this thing is like costed one twenty five. Our ballistas are what one thirty, one forty. So... 140? Oh, okay, so would you would you lose 5 points or 15 points to bring this? Like, just for that minus 1? Maybe, like, one of these one of these things? Or it, two of these? it depends. I might, if I have mm -hmm. 1 in my list, I might bring 1 for the minus 1 hit, but if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm bringing multiple ballistas and an ordinator, there, no. I would never, I would never trade a ballista for this thing if I'm going all in on ballistas if I'm making, like, a war machine list. Um, yeah. But if I have 1 ballista in my list, or if I have 125 points left over, and I want a once per game minus 1 hit effect, yeah, I'd consider it. Um, it is really, really fragile, though, so it'll just die to any amount of light shooting, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Whereas Ballistas are a beefy 4-up save with 9 wounds. Which is like, I don't understand why, but they are, so it's a nice thing about them. Mm -hmm. I, hey, I, the Stormcast Armor, Sigmarite Plating. This one is just like, <laughs> oh, it's elves. They don't really yeah, build armor. Yeah, sleeveless artillery guys, you know, they have a 4-up save. Yeah. Just like a Drake's Sworn Templar. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it's not a bad unit, right? Like it's not F tier. It's just yeah, it's it's like it's just that you can't take this in a dedicated artillery. Don't think of this as artillery. Think of this as like you know, 
if you're one of those people who are taking Celestar Ballistas without Lord Ordinators, without a plan for the Ballistas, these aren't bad. If they're, they're just staying stationary and they're giving you, you know, they're giving you those minus three attacks at minus two rent three, and D3, yeah. giving you that minus one to hit once a game, it's fine. There is a reason to use these guys. Stormcast have a lot of good shooting options. And if you're bringing a Lord Ordinator, you should not be bringing ballist these Ballistas. You should bring Celestar Ballistas instead because they'd all benefit from the Ordinator. But if you're just bringing one, it's a nice little utility piece. It sits back, it shoots, it does a little bit of damage, and it has mm -hmm. that once per game minus one hit for that turn. Yeah, it's, it's so, like in the it's like in the Duralia category again. Yeah. Like it's 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 that basically. But the only difference being, you know, it's not as durable, so it'll die really quick. Now, I I do need to clarify this. The minus one hit, um, I believe. Is only for that for that rest of that turn. So it's yes, only it useful. Yes, it is not until your next phase. Yes, it is not until your. Yes. Yeah. So it's only useful for avoiding counterattack damage. And and Stormcast, uh, we generally wipe stuff out. We're not that worried about counterattack damage. So even though it is a good effect to have minus one hit, it doesn't mm -hmm. last that long. If it lasted until the next hero phase, it would be amazing. But because it only lasts for that turn, it's not as good as. Yeah. Fair. And let's talk about the Oralon Sentinels. So they are a wizard unit with one cast and one in bind. And of course, the one spell they're going to cast every turn is their own spell. Uh, they're mm -hmm. 30 inch range, which is huge. And no line of sight required against one enemy unit per turn. So you pick an enemy unit and you don't need line of sight against that unit. Their hit rolls of six deal mortal wounds, which is very strong. And they can cast empower on themselves to deal the mortal wounds on a five up instead. And like you like listed here, you can just kind of put them somewhere and they just take care of stuff throughout the whole battle. Yeah, they're 150 points, and they don't need any support. Like, they're just, whatever they do, they do on their own. Yep. Now, the problem is, Stormcast are very spoiled for shooting. We have very, mm -hmm. very good shooting. We also do Mortal Wounds on hit rolls of six, but we do it with better accuracy and with rend when, when we fail to roll those sixes. Uh, so here's my question for you then, right? Because, so their fragility, because so the main, I think, cons against them is, like you, like the this slide suggests, for fragility, because they are five up save, six bravery, and they don't have cat hauler support like they do in Luminate armies where they just avoid battle shock. They're not getting Aether Quartz reserves or anything like that. They're not getting Shining Companies. They're not going to be natively minus one to hit in that close knit formation. They're an independent unit, which is nice. But however, from 30 inches away, you can fire 20 shots for 300 points, whereas that would cost you 400 points with Judicators. Is that is that 100 points more worth it? Or does that create some interesting? Well, you can double tap the adjudicators, right? I'm sorry. You can use Thunderbolt Volley with adjudicators. You can't use yeah, yeah, sentence. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, the adjudicators yeah. do quite a lot more damage unless you get the empower off, and then I think it changes it. I haven't mm -hmm. done a detailed analysis on it, but yeah, what makes yeah, yeah, no, what makes these guys are really definitely good is that yeah, they yeah are, these guys are really dependent are getting empower off. Once you remove yeah. that, they're extremely mediocre. Yep. Um, even in Luminate lists, like uh, for those of you who haven't played what they're doing. What they typically want to be doing is they want to get Empower off. They want to get, you know, Cathalers supporting their battle shock. They want to get a Shining Company, and they want to get something called Lamb and Light, which lets them reroll hit rolls against one enemy unit. Yep. And also, uh, and this part's crucial, you can only bring 20 max in the Stormcast army. What mm -hmm. really makes them good is that you can bring them in 30 in a Luminous army. Because yep. it, it's that critical mass of mortal wounds, right? Like doing eight mortal wounds, let's say, isn't that useful. But doing twelve mortal wounds could be that those those four extra mortal wounds are the difference between securing a kill or something surviving. And when you're dumping yeah. that many points in something, it's 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 about the critical mass. And when they're allies, they don't reach the critical mass. And they're also just incredibly mm -hmm. fragile, and you don't have the rest of the army supporting it. Like you don't have mm -hmm. the shining company, you don't have the, the 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 wind spirits running around doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So in a stormcast army, these guys are not good. So I'll I'll commend mm -hmm. Games Workshop for uh, designing one of the most oppressive and least fun units to ever play against and making it complete yeah, trash outside I, of their own army. Yeah, I mean, that is, I guess, one way to balance them. Otherwise, they'd be seeing play everywhere. Yeah, so there's there's a silver line. Um, speaking of more Lumineth, um, I'll let you take this one, because I, I have not seen this model on the table yet, so I don't have that much Yeah, it's, it's one of those models that came out with Broken Realms. Um, I think it came out with the last one, too. And nobody has really played this one yet as an ally because it it only exists as an ally. Lumina doesn't have space for it, and it only exists as an order ally. Some CD Sigmar lists are trying it out, but I haven't seen any like dedicated order faction like Seraphon or Stormcast try it out. And when I looked at this worst scroll, it's actually not bad. 
Um, it's, so it's a two spell wizard with a native plus one to cast, which you know is great as a support wizard. We can just get Mystic Shield off like that. It's got a three up save and a five up ward spell, which goes off on I think a six, which means with a plus one to cast, you need a five on the dice, which is good. At the start of your hero phase, you generate a CP on a four up, so it's value just you know starting on. It's got good melee attacks. Uh, it's probably got the best bird in the game. Like the owl, little owl, I think does better damage, has better hitting statistics than a liberator, which is yeah. yeah funny that, I think that was true in, that was, in second edition. And, yeah, it's true in third too, because it's not threes and fours; it's threes and threes. Oh. So, yeah, so that's really rubbing it in as to how much better elves are than us. Um, and the main thing to like about this is it's got so it's got two attacks in other or in melee that are like threes and threes minus one d three damage. That's always on. But the main thing is the um, Elethor's Sword, which is four attacks, twos and threes, so it doesn't need a lot of attack, minus two ren, and then the damage scales depending on which battle round you're in. So in the second battle round, which is the time when you're most likely to get this into combat, it's going to be doing two damage. And then in the third battle round, three. In the fourth battle round, four. And that accumulated value in combat, given how tough it is, because it's eight wounds, three up save, and you're almost always going to do the five up ward spell if you can on this, it's not bad. I think it's for a support hero that generates value through spell casting, through CP generation, and gets better at fighting as the game goes on. It's pretty good. Okay. Um, the, the only caveat that I don't like is there is a forced translocation caveat. So if this model fights, then at the end of the combat phase, you roll a dice. Uh, if the dice roll is uh, less than the number of the uh, current battle round or less than the number of wounds that this model has taken, um, then you heal these six wounds allocated to this model, and then you basically are forced to teleport it anywhere on the battlefield 12 inches away from enemy units. Now, this can work for you or against you, right? It, because it moves at the end of combat phase, it means if you kill something, like let's say battle round three or four, it means the enemy has to move up to charge you, and you can move it to safety behind a screen. On the other hand, you might need it to stick in combat for the next battle round. You might need to say, okay, I'm in battle round three, I just did three damage, I need to do four damage next turn. And that might become harder because you're forced to translocate it away. And that sort of creates uncertainty around how this model is supposed to be played. What's the best, I guess, play, line of play for this model? Mm -hmm. And I legitimately want to make a list around him. You know, He's expensive. I mean, they're expensive. They're 285 points. So it's like 20 more than a slot, I think. Yeah. Well, but let me... I, I genuinely think there could be some, some uh, there, there could be a place where he fits in. Let me make the case against it. Um... Sure. So there's a lot of downsides to this model. It, it is expensive. At 285, it's starting to creep up there with the Andrastus, less than Prime. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah. It's getting up right? there with the Primes. Yeah, it yeah. used to be 240. At 240 in second end, it was great. And then the GHB came and 285 was just oof. So like, like Andrasta, I don't think they're going to do enough damage to justify all their utility that they have. Especially because the utility is hard to use. Right? The, you only get the command point if you're within three inches of your general which means they're basically like a bodyguard that sticks around your general, but then they can be forced teleported, in which case they can't be, right? Uh, the force teleport is a huge one because... The force teleport is only if it fights. So so think about it this way, right? And if you're so, not fighting, you're not getting it. It's small, right? You shouldn't bring it if you're not fighting with it. Yeah, yeah. you have to fight with it, but if it's, I guess it's almost a there to support your general CP generation. Like if you don't want to get your general into combat, you could translocate to your general. Sure. <laughs> the problem is there's a lot cheaper ways to get more command points. And also, yeah. we don't really need more command points. We're a very efficient army in that way. We have enough mm -hmm. for what we want to do. Uh, if you want more, take a Rune Lord and take the Prayer to generate them on a 5-up. Or take a Relictor and take the Prayer to generate them on a 4-up. You really need mm -hmm. more command points for some reason. He, it's, it's like a Yandrosta problem. He's not getting enough damage and not getting yeah. enough value at the same time. Like If this was split into two different models that were you know 180 points each, I think it would be better because you could take one or, or the other but not both. But the fact that it tries to cram both into a single war scroll, neither one of mm -hmm. them is that good. It's very unfortunate. Uh, now, also, I think it, yeah, I think it's a tad bit overcosted. Definitely. Yeah. Also, I think, the fact I think it's that a cost the, issue. Yeah. The damage scaling with the round is a bad thing. Like you might think, oh, it's cool. I can do five damage in round five. But what that means is you're doing one damage in round one and two damage in round two. The only time it starts to get mm -hmm. anywhere decent is round three. And I'm sure you probably know a lot of people know this. By round three, the game's already determined. Right, we know how yeah. the game is going to go, starting round three onwards. Round one and two are kind of feeling out, taking early jabs at each other, maybe making big plays. Uh, but most games will probably end around round. Three. You know who's going to win by round three. So the fact that it takes this model the majority of the game, it's just not doing much damage, and it has all these caveats and a high cost. I'm not feeling it. I'm really not feeling this one. 
Yeah, I think it's. I think it could be a cost issue. I think if if it was a bit more competitively costed, two twenty, I could consider this, two twenty to thirty, which you know closer to its first initial cost. But yeah, two eighty five. Yeah, it's a steep price to pay for something that, essentially, you want to keep planning around playing the game longer. Now, does it have a place in Storm Keeps where you do want the game to go past round three, where you start taking objectives? Maybe. If you're if you're holding a model in reserve and waiting for it to come online at turn three, we've got Celestial Prime. He does it better. Mm. I mean, but does, is he generating the same amount of value for the first two turns in terms of the two spells and the CP gen? No, but I mean, he I mean, does a lot more when it comes in. Mm, fair, okay. And also, I also want to mention this. Oh, sorry, a, I forgot to mention. Yeah, yeah, it has the shooting attack once per game that also scales. So yeah, it lives I, to like round three, round four. I like the shooting attack. I was actually just about to talk about it, um, but. The five up ward spell, I, I should mention, that's terrible. But instead of just having a five up ward all the time, you have to burn one of your spell cast, and it and it's not like mm-hmm. you can put the ward on anything else, right? So it's like you have a chance of getting a five up ward if you give up one of your spells. That's that's an awful ability. Why didn't they just give them a five up ward? Would they have been really broken if they had two spells? Yeah, and I, I think ward? so. Yeah, I think with all their utility, because fi- a guaranteed five up ward would mean they're always like like what do you mean like a two cast wizard with a five up ward just guaranteed? Yeah, or make them a one cast think, wizard with a guaranteed. Five I think up that ward. would have that would have had to go up in points because it, the the idea is like to fi- use the five up ward as a way to protect itself when it's to because it's a really good utility wizard, right? So if it always had a five up ward, it'd be really really strong. The idea is you use you don't use that five award spell initially uh, if your opponent doesn't have any like range damage or whatever while it's behind enemy lines sort of charging up you use it purely as a support wizard and then later on when you like throw it into combat like you know round through round two round three when it when its damage goes up that's when you pop the five award spell I, I feel that but I think it's going to be too late if you don't have it active all the time you can get caught off guard by shooting or surprise charges and it's not yeah. impossible like we Stormcast have models with four awards all the time. And one of the next models we're about to look at is a two-spell wizard that has a four-up ward all the time. So it's not impossible. I think this is... Yeah, I think it was a mistake to make it a spell rather than just something that's active. I don't like that design. Fair. If it was, you know, you have a six-up ward all the time and you can cast a spell to make it a four, that's fine because, you know, you have something, right? And mm-hmm. you're, like, supercharging it. It feels good. I just... I'm not a fan of that design. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so I placed it in D-tier... Would you have done the same, or do you think you would have placed it up in, in C or maybe even B? I think if it was 240, I'd be C. Because um, okay. I could like see you know, taking a Star Drake with it or something, and then making it like a plus two to cast and do some shenanigans with that. No, it was yeah, like a general Star Drake, right? Would it be able to keep yeah, up yeah. with it? Because um, you have to do it three inch inches move. in the hero phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a six inch move, so it can move up to mid boards with a run move pretty reliably. If it's in combat, it'll just translocate to the Star Drake if, it, if possible. So. Yeah, I don't know. I think D is right for now. Okay. I'm okay with this rating. Okay. The goal wasn't to like make you agree with me, it's to discuss it, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I know, I know. I'm just like, I'm just thinking of like I, I like its use. I just don't like its points. I think I yeah. would you like at two eighty five it's way too steep and it's like too close to Bastion. Like I'd rather just take Bastion. Yeah, if this thing was competing with Dracoths or Judicators, I might consider it. Mm-hmm. And then let's talk about the Severith or Huracan Spirit of the Wind. The um, other most uninteractive shit compared to Sentinels. Yeah. Not a fan of this model personally. I think it, it borders into that. I, I love abilities that break the rules of the game. I really do. But this this borders into oppressive territory. But let's talk about it. So both of them are a 24-inch flying move uh, with a 5-up ward. And they have a pretty good missile attack. Not you know cost-effective compared to what we could bring, but it's it's a good enough missile weapon that you can't just ignore this thing for the whole game. It yeah, always it's always all out attack. It's fours yep. and two, four, no, four attacks, twos and threes, minus two rend or minus three rend, d three damage. Yes, it, it's quite threatening. It can pop off small support heroes. It can put chunks out of uh, bigger units. It's especially oppressive in Lumineth, where they bring multiples of these things and they all focus fire and they just take out one thing mm-hmm. per turn. Uh, but the biggest reason, the biggest the whole thing about this model is that it moves twelve inches at the end of both shooting phases. And it's very good at getting stuck into a combat, surviving that round, and then and then retreating away in the enemy turn, which denies them the ability to make any kind of useful move or charge. Yep, they so can only guys, make retreat moves. Yep. Yeah, so these guys are are really good at just shutting down enemy armies. Now, in a in a Lumineth army, you can have multiples of these guys running around and playing the whole field. In a Stormcast army, you can only bring one max because of ally limits. So you could potentially yeah. just shut down a flank 
you know, no chaos knights, uh, no chariots, nothing's getting across that flank because this thing is sitting there guarding. And the whole time it's shooting damage into key targets. Yep. Um, yeah, I think, oh God, like the fact that it's so good as a Stormcast ally should speak to how oppressive this is because it's not even getting the Huracan battle traits, which for those of you who don't know in Lumineth, uh, her, all Huracan units get a six inch pilot. And these things have three inch range in combat. So what Lumineth players like to do is they charge it in um, and then they hit you with that minus one to hit. Um, then they pile in 2.9 inches away because they ignore all pylon rules, so they don't have to pile in to the closest units. They can just pile in however they want. And so they, they are basically exactly 2.9 away. They reduce your pile in, which is for most units is 3 inches to 1 inch, so you can basically never fight them unless you have a large part of your army on like 3 inch range attacks or something. And then, like Paul said, retreat in your turn. So it, effectively, it's like a back and forth where you're not just you're just making constant retreat moves and not even playing Warhammer while they lock you down and kill your army slowly. Yep. And even if you are able to retreat and charge, because these guys make the move in the shooting phase after you've moved already, and they have fairly large bases that you, they take up a lot of space, they can just mm -hmm. walk away. Yeah, you can't catch them. So a lot of people say that, uh, you know, they only have a 5-up save, they only have 8 games, they have, or 7 at this time, but... Uh, and they have a five award, so they're you know you should be able to just kill them. You will never catch these with a melee unit, not even through deep strikes. Your best hope is range projection. If your army doesn't have that, you're gonna have a tough time against these things. And this is why we this is partly why Paul and I push you know the the necessity of taking ranged units in Stormcast so bad because if you're just taking liberators and you know vindictors or whatever and your retributors, this these things are gonna kill you. Yeah, they they will crumble to shooting. Right, they're only. Eight wounds for the wind spirit. I don't think Severeth is worth using personally. I think he's too expensive. Um, yeah, yeah, no. no the the extra things he gets are not worth the extra points you spend for it. Mm -hmm. uh, the wind spirit is not a leader or a behemoth or even a hero. Right? It's just a troop unit, um, mm -hmm. which is both good and bad. Um, but they will die to shooting, and this, this is one of the big reasons I, I I try to push shooting in every army I play because these things are such a threat. When you face these things on the battlefield and you you, you know, you just have a bunch of brutes or some cabbages or something. Yeah, I mean, cabbages can catch them, right? They can catch anything. But um, uh, no, they can't. I don't think so. Yeah, because you can double flank them, so regardless of which way they go. Oh, I mean, yeah, if you have, yeah, if you have, yeah, yeah, two, sure, perfect, yeah. Sure. yeah. You need very specific counters to deal with these things, and melee units are really bad at it. Whereas shooting, shooting doesn't care about any of these fancy movement shenanigans these guys are doing. And if they yeah. charge in, you can unleash shell, so it even helps you out. Yeah, I think these things are due for an FAQ, but yeah, as an ally, uh, so because sorry, we just talked about how good they were and didn't talk about it as an ally. Uh, yeah, you don't want to be charging with these things. You don't want to try and lock those flanks down like you, you, you can. Normally. It's it's not as effective as you would an Illumineth army, uh, but yeah. if you hit on the right flank, you can give enemies minus one hit, and you can still try to survive. You can't tank, you know, really heavy stuff like you could if an Illumineth army. But if you're hitting, you know, a squad of five Chaos Knights, yeah, you can probably survive that. Yeah, and uh, uh, what I, yeah, so it's basically like a mobile artillery battery for two sixty five points. A mobile artillery battery that has some locking down uses. Um, and when we when you talk about tactics next next week, we'll talk about a list that did really well at a recent tournament with one of these guys. So yeah, so I think that. B tier is pretty appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. They're not as good as they are in Lumineth, and I, I I wouldn't put them in A tier or S tier like the Phoenix or the Battle Mage, but they are very good allies and. They're hard to use. I will say that as well. They're not. It's not yeah, obvious yeah. why these guys are as good as they are. You have mm -hmm. to really I understand so. how the game works and, and what your opponent can and can't do. Um, they're they're not an easy unit to use effectively. Agreed. All right. Uh, JJ, I I don't I don't think you've played against Lumineth yet, have you? Only games I've played against were STD, Seraphon, and uh, Ogres recently. It is a. Uh, it is a different kind of game when you play Lumen. Oh. They're oh yeah, they have their own rule set. You're playing a different game when you play them. Yeah, I had uh, recently at my FLGS. I had somebody who was looking to play a game this Friday, and uh, I offered to do so. But then when I heard that they were running LRL, I was kind of just like, "I'm well, gonna catch painting." <laughs> okay, I hate that it's come to that. Right, that everybody talks so negatively about them that it's turning people off from playing about them. I don't want to derail the whole video about it, but I, I you should play against them. It's not not that bad. In the competitive scene, it's a lot worse, right? It's a lot worse mm -hmm. than in competitive games. In friendly games, it's probably fine. And I will say it's just really hard to play against Illuminate when you're facing a very competent player. The rule set of that book makes it really difficult. Yeah. 
All right, section four, Seraphon. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Seraphon are my main army, despite the fact that I host a Stormcast podcast. <laughs> Seraphon are still my main jam. They're always going to be my boys. Um, wow. So I like them a lot, and let's talk about them. Uh, so the first one is the Slan Starmaster. He is a free spell wizard with plus one to cast, unbind, and dispel. And you can combo that with Stardrake for a plus two to cast. You can unbind and dispel anywhere on the field. doesn't matter. You can be in one corner and the spell can be in the other corner and you can try to unbind and dispel it. Um, he is a very good wizard if you just want to cast endless spells and mystic shield. And his signature spell, Comet's Call, has unlimited range and it just does D3 mortal wounds to a bunch of units. So throughout yep. the course of five rounds, this guy is great. He's going to chip away at a lot of things. He's gonna, You can do some focused fire with it. It's great. And on top of all that, he generates two command points in your hero phase, each on a four up. So that's just yeah, that's a really lot. Strong. That's a lot of value for 265 points. Like if the rest of your army is focused on really specific things, you can spend 265 and get a pretty good wizard. Uh, mm -hmm. Now the downsides, it's 265 points. You could be bringing Dracoths, you could be bringing Paladins, Judicators, Raptors, all kinds of things. Um, and the biggest downside is that he has three spells, but if you don't bring an endless spell, all he's casting is Mystic Shield, Comet's Call, and Arcane Bolt, because he can't learn any of the universal spells as an ally. Mm -hmm. So, he's really a two-spell wizard that you can pay points to make a three-spell wizard, which is kind of kind of lackluster. Uh, yeah. He, he's very slow, he's not a fast boy, and he's, and he's fragile. You know, for 265 points, you're only getting seven wounds, it's not great. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gets sniped off pretty easily unless he has his bodyguard around him, which are just more points that you're dumping into this what should be an efficient wizard. Uh, you don't want to put him anywhere near combat, right? He's, he's, he has six attacks uh, with Rend 1, but you don't want him fighting. And uh, it takes a lot of time to get back the points that you spend on him. Because Comet's Call and, and Mystic Shield are, they only go so far. Yep. So the Slan Star Master is good. He was better when we had the realm spells in second edition. I loved having realm spells. I hope they bring that back. He can, you know, he can do metamorphosis every turn to turn something into a monster. How useful is that? I don't know. He he'll usually end up just casting him, turning himself into a monster. But you don't want him near melee. So why bother? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Anything that's big in our army is normally a monster anyway. I guess you could turn a green draster or something into a monster. But you, I don't know. How yeah. There's, you know, niche battle tactics use, but it's nothing a normal wizard couldn't do, right? Mm -hmm. He's just a very efficient three spell wizard. So he's good, but there's limitations, and, and for his cost, maybe, maybe not in every list. Yeah. Might even be better just to run two encanters, honestly. But I like him. I like this land. The, the generating command points is a big thing that's underlooked. You can do a lot of really wacky stuff. If you have extra command points, you can do redeploy as mm -hmm. an extra unleash hell when you wouldn't normally. So yeah, it, 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 yeah, it accumulates value, especially if you take a Star Drake random. Like being able to be like, okay, I can just throw away this command point on unleash hell on that Star Drake's like uh, rend three two damage attack. It's pretty good. Yeah, he's he's a value machine. Do we need value? Maybe, maybe not. Right now, the game is so fast paced. Games are typically decided by round three. I don't think you get enough value out of it. But if the game mm -hmm. does slow down, we'll see. Yeah. In contrast yeah. to the Slan is the Skink Oracle on Troglodon. So he's he's also a wizard with plus one to cast on binding the spell. He only casts one spell per turn, but he has the Comet's Call spell just like the Slan. So, and he costs the same amount. So you compare him to the Slan, and instead of getting an extra spell, because realistically you're only casting two spells a turn with the Slan, you get five wounds and a monster body. And, you know, pretty pathetic melee, but a monster body, right? Really good for battle yeah. tactics. Um, yeah. And he heals uh, automatically on the hero phase, which is... Yeah, on a two-up. Uh, I don't think he actually generates command points. I think that's a typo. So please ignore that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he generates command points. Um, he can reroll charge if, if his shooting attack does damage, but it usually doesn't because it's D3 shots and no rend. So good luck with that. Um, mm -hmm. Like the slant, he can't learn any spells. His damage isn't great. Um, only bravery six, so you're not going to be doing any rec heroic recoveries with him. Uh, yeah. It, it, it would be an alternative to the slant. Like, if what you're bringing the slant for is Comet's Call, this guy is, is a monster with Comet's Call. That's his niche. So, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, it's, it's only 220, so... I think two, that, that might be another typo. It's not 265. It's, like, I think... Are you sure? 
I thought he was 265. Oh, yeah, you're right. No, no he's two, actually 270. Yeah, you're right. Oh, 270. Okay. So mm -hmm. five points more. My two mistakes in one slide. I'm getting sloppy. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you value the slan, if you think it's a good choice, consider the Skink Oracle and Troglodon because it's a. Uh, because the slant is not casting all three of his spells every turn, this guy is not bad. Mm -hmm. It's but, a good fine alternative if you want, want some monster tactics. But yeah, yeah, this is this is the real unit that I'll. Yeah, this about. is this guy is great. Um, so he does generate command points on a four up. The reason you want to bring the Skink Star Seer is because of his signature spell, which you pick an enemy unit within eighteen inches and you give it minus one to save rolls. That's insane. That's an insane yeah. spell. Grandis has yeah. that, and he costs six hundred points. Yeah. But here, this guy costs 145, and he generates you command points while he does it. Yep. Awesome. I God, mean, it's it is... so good. Like, it's it basically increasing rend across your army when you hit that unit. Yep. And it, and Stormcast have good volume fire with low rend, like crossbows. Or maybe you yeah. just want rend three raptors, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's... Why not? Like, or rend two judicators. Why not? Yeah. yeah giving yeah. one unit per turn minus one save is incredibly strong in third edition. In second edition, it wasn't that strong. There were more units on the board. Focused fire was generally in the overkill variety, so giving it, you know, force multipliers were so plentiful that a minus one save roll wasn't as valuable as it is now. Uh, but especially mm -hmm. these days, in the save stacking meta, and the fact that this happens in the hero phase, which means you can Thunderbolt Bali at minus one, yeah, but they don't have a chance to all-out defense. Um, yeah, you can stack this with all kinds of stuff. You can stack it with Grandis, you can produce enemy save rolls by two, you can hit them with a Geminids to deny all that defense, effectively giving your units rend three against them. Because yeah. anything that you're you're stacking that much on, they're going to want all that defense. Um, yep. Yeah, he's great for 145 great points. Unit. Yeah, that's the value for 145. Totally Absolutely. Bad. Yeah. And a, another little piece of value he has here is that he can give a Seraphon unit a 3d6 charge. Now he's only he's 145, so the additional Seraphon units you bring have to be pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. now, we'll, we'll, talk be... about, we'll talk about yeah, two fifty-five. Carnosaur. <laughs> you could bring a Carnosaur. I don't see the, the problem with a lot of Seraphon units is that all of their strength comes from their allegiance abilities and their yeah. their synergies with each other. Their war scrolls yeah, yeah. on their own are not particularly impressive. Uh, like Carnosaurs can become kill monsters, and Stegodons on Skink Chiefs can just stack all these buffs and get tons of attacks and do tons of damage. But it all requires playing a Seraphon army. They don't do it yep, as yep. allies. Yeah, they're very CP intensive and like yeah. command ability intensive army. Yeah. So downsides of this model, uh, we're gushing about how good it is, but there are some serious downsides here. At 145 points, you're replacing either a Knight Cantor or a Lord Relictor or some kind of unit, right? Stormcast are, are trim on points. So the fact that you're bringing this guy who's only going to generate command points and debuff enemies, you got to make sure, like it, it is a consideration in your list. You can't just slam him into everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, what are you replacing? What are you taking out? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he is fragile. He's only five wounds. He's not very fast. Um, he can fly, which is nice, and he can give himself a three d six charge if, for some reason, you want to throw him into combat for uh, mm -hmm. maybe capturing hey, an objective. You could use that time. as like a you could use that as like a movement thing where like you charge it with annihilators and you charge him in just to get an extra bit of movement out of him. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's it's not nothing. I, I've yeah. Games are won by movement, like I said. Sometimes it is the right choice to throw a wizard into combat, just to have another body on an objective. Yeah. Uh, his his spell is cast value 7, and he doesn't have any bonuses to cast outside of Seraphon Allegiance. So yep. it's not easy. Not easy, but if you bring a Star Drake, it's a little more reliable. So overall, I really rate this guy at a B tier. If the spell was any easier to cast, he would be an A tier unit like the, like the Battle Mage. Um, mm hmm He's so just so cheap compared to a lot of other stuff we've talked about, and the utility he offers right. for his points is so good. So I have a question. So regarding, so there's another skink priest. I think that's at one thirty, right? And yep. his spell, I'm pretty sure, goes up on a six. Would you consider taking him over this guy because he's cheaper? I mean, he doesn't have the same. I think four up. I think his CP generation happens on a five up. Yeah, so that's the, the skink star that's the skink star priest, and like you said, he's 130 points. So he's a little bit cheaper. He is only four wounds as opposed to five. Uh, his CP generation's on a five up instead. He, the mm -hmm. main reason you bring Star Priest isn't because he's a wizard. That, that is important in a Seraphon list because you want to do vassal casting. The, the Slan can like channel his spells through nearby skink heroes. But in a as an ally, all he brings is his spell, which is pick an enemy unit, it has minus one hit. And there's just yeah. so many other ways to get that. And the fact that he's yeah, only yeah. four wounds, he's just a liability. Um, this guy's spell is so much stronger. A minus one save effect is really rare. 
and he does reliably generate uh, command points. More reliably, okay. I should say. So no, no, I wouldn't consider the Star Priest, personally. Um, we just have other ways of getting a minus one hit. We don't really have, don't, no army really has any way to get a minus one save except uh, Stormcast, and I think one of the city's subfractions in Seraphon. So yeah. it's a really powerful effect, especially with how we do damage. Our crossbows are love rend effects, so it's really powerful. Agreed. Uh, so here we have Chameleon Skinks. We mentioned these guys earlier when we talked about the Cities of Sigmar. They are a, a relatively cheap... They're 150 points, so 5 points cheaper than Shadow Warriors. They're just a relatively cheap Deep Strike unit. If you want a Deep Strike, 5 models, tiny little footprint, stick them somewhere, start shooting and doing Mortal Wounds, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. here you go. I take these over Shadow Warriors, if I'm being honest. Yeah, the only reason Shadow Warriors even made our list is because they're 10 bodies. Which could yeah. matter for objective purposes, whereas these guys are five bodies. Yep, but like they're they're the exact same role, but better offense and smaller yep. footprint. Yep. Do you want to teleport better five bodies too. somewhere? Well, they're about the same defense because they're a six up save. No, they have a four up ward, don't they? Yeah, but that just or doubles no, their effective it. wounds. It takes ten wounds to kill yeah. them. Shadow warriors yeah. are ten wounds, right? They're they're basically yeah, the sure. same. They're more Perfect. they're more resilient against mortals. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the the fact that they have a teeny tiny little footprint, you can. Fit them into crevices that you wouldn't be able to fit ten shuttle wounds, which is very skinky. Mm -hmm. And they do mortal wounds, right? Like their their shooting is better, I would say. Ten shots, yeah. you'll do one or two mortal wounds every time you shoot. Yeah, yeah. C I, that, might be good. a bit much, but uh, C. I, minus, I mean, the, 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 I think deep strike makes them C. I think because if they didn't have deep strike, they would be D. Like deep strike is like your enemy can't hurt them; they can just pop down and like if you take two of these guys for two thirty. Uh, you know, they have 20 shots, 6 is doing mortal wounds, and that's not bad for a deep striking unit. Yeah. It's really not like, bad. That's so. like adjudicator level. Yeah, that's like adjudicator level almost. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that, that is adjudicator shooting pretty much for a little bit more price in exchange for deep strike native, I guess. Mm -hmm. But we're not hurting for deep strike. So this is specifically... Yeah, no, yeah, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm just saying like, yeah, for like deep strike shooting, it's, 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 it's not a bad use. Like Storm Keeps, I would take them. I, w I would certainly consider them. Um, should be pointed out, the models are really old and really bad, and they put out a really sick model in Underworlds for Chameleon Skinks, so hopefully they're due for new plastics at some point. Yeah, me too. I'm actually, that's what's stopping me from starting Seraphon, is the sick amount of resin in that range. Yeah, they're one of those armies that still has a bunch of resin, unfortunately. Speaking of which, the Razor Dawn Hunting Pack. So, let me make a case for these guys. They are cheap, they're only 95 points, for 2d6 shots. They are on 3s and 4s, which is, you know, most of our shootings on 3s and 3s. Um, so 3s and 4s is, isn't good. Uh, but, just like you made the case for the Vendensed, she, she could fill little slots in a list. Razor Dawn Hunting Packs can do the same thing. They're a 4-up save, just like a lot of our Stormcast shooting. 8-inch move, 18-inch shooting. So they're a little bit faster. 18-inch uh, shooting is, is our lower end of shooting. Uh, but when you, when you stick it on an 8-inch eight, eight move, it's not that bad. If they get within six inches of an enemy, they get rend one. And the most important reason, the coolest reason, I should say, is they have this ability called instinctive defense. And how this ability works is at the end of the charge phase, if they had, if at the start of the charge phase, there's no enemies there, and at the end of the charge phase, there are enemies in their face, they can shoot. They can shoot 1d6 shots. So you can shoot in the shooting phase for 2d6, and then shoot in the charge phase for 1d6. Now keep in mind, in the charge phase, if you do an offensive charge or they come to you, they both work. And you'll be within six inches of the enemy, so you'll get Ren on that shot. And in the charge phase, your opponents can't use all that defense. And, well, that, that and it stacks that, yeah. with Unleash Hell. So if you Unleash Hell with this unit, and then you use the Instinctive Defense, you're doing 3d6. And the Instinctive Defense is not at minus one either. Interesting. Then... Once you get into melee, these guys hit like Dracons. They have three attacks at threes and threes, rent two, two damage. Uh, for 95 points, huh? Not yeah. Bad. So take two of these guys, reinforce it, 12 wounds at four up, 46 shots in the shooting phase, 2d6 shots in the charge phase, and six Dracoth attacks in the combat phase. So compare them to Judicators, compare them to Tempesters, compare them to a lot of other Stormcast units, and they're not looking bad, right? They are on threes and fours. I got to mention that again. So they're less accurate. They're not going to, even with the same number of attacks, they're, they're, they're not going to pump out as much damage. And they only get rend within six inches, but 
for 180 points, they're they're a nice versatile unit. They do a lot of damage in a lot of different phases. They have a lot of utility in their Unleash Hell potential. Mm -hmm. And if you have a Star Seer in your army, these guys can have a 3d6 charge. Oh yeah! <laughs> wow. Yeah, and high volume shots with a Ren debuff combo really well together. Especially because uh, you charge yeah. in and start hitting them at Ren three. It's surprising all that combo is available, all sub 400 points. That's yep. pretty amazing. And the best part is that the skink handlers that fly around them, they're basically just extra wounds. So this unit, all three handlers have to die. Well, they don't have to. You can choose to kill all three handlers before you take any wounds on the Razor Dawn. And the Razor Dawn yeah. is three wounds. So it takes six wounds to kill one of these guys. Oh, that's really and if you, have, if you have two of them in a unit, it takes nine wounds to kill one of these guys. Because you have to kill all six handlers first, then you start taking Razor Dawn units. Pretty good. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, they're bravery five. So as soon as those skinks die, the razor dons are just going to run away. So, hey, that's why you bring the star steer, so you can just use that extra CP on bravery. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Even more combo. <laughs> so the cons, uh, aside from the fact that it's a really old and not very appealing resin model, uh, we have lots of good shooting options already. But this is just such an interesting one to me. It really does fill yeah, that same it's... kind of niche as Tempesters. They're 40 points cheaper, but very similar in a lot of ways. I really like yeah. them. Yeah. Not a bad... Yeah. There's resin, so I wouldn't buy it, but no. and then, if you're happy, you can try them. They're really expensive each. I think it's like 30 bucks. 30 bucks each. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't get them. Like... If you happen to be a Seraphon player and also play Stormcast, you can consider using the Razor Dons and a Star Seer. I really like that combo together. Penultimate section here, the Sylvaneth, which are not elves or elves or, or any of that. They are a completely yeah, different thing. Now. Different thing. All right. They're not yeah. elves. Don't even want to see it in the comments. First up, the Warsong Revenant, introduced in the Broken Realms. He is a two spell wizard with a minus one bravery aura, which is, you know, we don't have bravery auras anymore, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but it's seven wounds and a four up ward, effectively making him 14 wounds all the time. And he can mm -hmm. get cover and look out, sir. And he has an 8-inch flying move. And unlike a lot of other allied wizards, he knows every spell from the Sylvaneth lore, which gives him a lot of versatility. So he can mm -hmm. cast a Throne of Vines, which gives him bonuses to casting until he moves. And then he can start pumping damage with his uh, signature spell, which does damage based on the cast value. Then he can also heal himself for d6, and he can do an anti-horde spell. He's got a lot of versatility. The other spells aren't great for, for our purposes, but... Uh, this is a very versatile allied wizard that we can bring in. Yeah. Downsides. That part is expensive and you, uh, yeah, yeah. you can't uh, do anything. Yeah. Uh, the only way to, to use the Verdant Blessing spell is to use the Sylvaneth Allegiance allied units. Even if you know every spell in the Sylvaneth lore, the spell that creates woods is not part of that lore. Technically, It's just outside of it. Like, literally, if you look in the book, it's, it's physically higher than the lore, so it's not part of it, so you can't use it. Uh, he is mm -hmm. kind of fragile at a 5-up save. He's just going to take damage very easily. So even though he's effectively 14 wounds, he's he's just taking a lot of damage with a 5-up save. And even though he's a 2 He can die wizard, easily. Yeah. yeah. 275, I think he can do better. Uh, but there is just a lot of versatility in this. And, and I like the War Scroll. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm just, you know, Rose Tinted Goggles, Stormcast Wizard just so bad that anytime I see a 2-spell wizard... Any like, <laughs> yeah, look at that. Hey, that's fair. Yeah, hey. I mean, he's like, I don't know, because... He's about the same as Elania and Ella Florence. And I think, like, I, and I look at him and I'm like, I, I'm, I might just take Elania if I'm ever considering taking him. I can see that, yeah. He's not bad. C might be a bit high. Yeah, I think he's D. C I think minus. if Elania is D. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think if Elania is D, he's definitely D. If, yeah. Word and Lesson was part of the lore, if you could, like, cast a spell to deploy a wood somewhere, that'd be insanely useful as an allied ability. To be if able to if we go back like into that. a horde meta, I think he might be worth a C just because he has that anti-horde spell. But Stormcast sure, aren't yeah. hurting. They're not hurting yeah, for yeah. anti-horde stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I should have rated this guy D. Maybe I just That's like fair. the model. Yeah, maybe the model is sick. Yeah, the model is definitely extremely one of the better models they've made. Alright, let's take a look at the Tree Lord Ancient. Um, he's a one-spell wizard for 295 points. 
which is not great. That's somehow even worse than Stormcast Wizards, especially because he doesn't have mm -hmm. any bonuses to casting. Uh, so why did we even bother including him? Well, because once per game, he can set up Wildwoods, assuming that is allowed as an ally. We're not 100% certain. The faction yeah. terrain rules aren't totally clear on this, uh, but we're going to yeah, operate... Yeah, but the War Scroll says he can. So. Yes, I'm going to assume it's possible, unless an FAQ proves me wrong at some point. Um, he does have a wild a war scroll spell to just do mortal wounds around those wild woods. He can teleport to the wild woods, so you can stick them on one side and then you can shoot them back when you need them. Um, you mm -hmm. can create woods and then you can use the Night Heraldor to shake them, which is a hilarious combo. <laughs> was even more Definitely. hilarious when the Heraldor was relevant. Not so much anymore these days. Uh, yeah, he does offer a fight last mechanic. I think I believe this is the only way Stormcast have a fight last mechanic, and it is yep, on a four. Three, that's the only ally. Yep. yep, and it's within it's within three, but. Yeah, it's on a 4 of. Yeah. He's he's bravery 9 so he can heal himself really efficiently with heroic recovery. He's durable, he's a 3 up save. He has a he has an all out defense command ability basically, so you don't have to all out defense with him. You can use on another unit. And he is a hero mm -hmm. monster wizard that's durable, so for certain battle plans that's really useful. Uh, but he's he's slow, he's expensive. He has no ward save, so he just kind of ends up dying to focused fire. Doesn't have any bonuses to casting. He only casts one spell and all of his damage is really high there. His D6 is everywhere in his War Scroll, so sometimes he yeah. spikes high and does a lot, but sometimes just no. Yeah. yeah, like his attacks aren't bad. It's just if it was like three or four damage each, like it'd be far more useful as a model. Mm -hmm. So the only reason this guy made the list is because of the fight last and because of the free woods. So if you value those for a particular strategy, then great. Uh, otherwise, pass. We can do better. Mm -hmm. Especially for his point cost. Agreed, yeah. And I believe this is the last Sylvaneth unit, uh, the Tree Revenants. Mm -hmm. They're just another teleporting unit. They are The reason they made the cutoff list and some other units didn't is because they are, I believe, the cheapest one that can do this. For 80 points, you can teleport five bodies every time. It's not a yep. deep strike, so they are vulnerable to being killed before they can teleport. Um, but if they, your opponent's targeting them in the corner of a board or something, they're wasting their time. So yeah. They're likely to survive. So. Uh, unlike the other units we included that have shooting attacks so they can teleport somewhere near an objective and threatens like weaker units. These guys don't do any shooting. They just have melee attacks which aren't aren't very good. Uh, yeah. They can, you know, reroll a charge so they're not terrible at getting into melee. But, but that's not how you want them. So Yeah. They they are just the absolute cheapest at what they do. At this specific niche, these guys are the cheapest. So yeah. They they make the cutoff to be included on these slides. Something worth considering. And yep. the last ally, singular, that we can use is one of the Sons of Bayamot. In particular, it is Bundo Whalebiter. Uh, I'll let you take this one, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, so uh, Bundo Whalebiter is a mercenary. Um, so he basically sort of disregards that allied point limit. And this thing is essentially a big beat stick. It's a Kraken Eater Mega Gargant. So it has the ability, which I think is probably one of the best abilities in the game, especially for that faction, which is you can kick an objective 2d6 inches. And that's why I value him. So if you're a highly elite army and you're worried about, you know, you don't have anything, I guess, you don't want to maintain the control of your backfield objective or leave a unit behind, you can just kick it forward. Um, and, it, and it's really good. Or you can, you know, advance this guy to mid-board objectives and kick them into your deployment zone in Storm Keeps. And suddenly your Liberators are counting as 15 models without the turn three stipulation. His special ability as a mercenary is that he can fight last to reroll all hit rolls in combat. And he has some model sniping ability similar, similar to uh, Cavernous Jaws, uh, where you pick D3 models and then you uh, roll double their wounds characteristics to instantly slay them. And it's just a beat stick, so it's got a bunch of two damage attacks, a bunch of D3 and D6 damage attacks, um, which is good. Um, the bad is that the reason you take Gargans, or the reason anyone plays Gargans, is for the Mightier mix right here, which makes them count as 20 models, or 30 models in a Taker tribe. Um, and as you're taking, and you don't get that at all. And uh, you also are at a CP deficit, de deficit uh, in the first uh, battle round, because you took a Mercenary, and he's 490 points. And as an ally, a Mercenary, he cannot take any the uh, arcane tome amulet or destiny stuff that guardians are like likely to take to increase their survivability yeah and so he's just not a good use of his points for a beat stick that can move objectives around because formulator is coming at 460 and they absolutely wreck him yep but i i gotta say kicking objectives for redeemers on storm keeps 
hilarious. That's one of the best oh, yeah. interactions in the entire game. Yep. Even if you kick an objective one inch, right? If it's on the border between two territories, now yeah. all of your liberators are are free to. That is yep. such a hilarious like, interaction. That yep. That is that is the definitely the best combo this guy has uh, is in storm keeps where you just move him up twelve inches, you take an objective, and they don't take it away from you, so you can just kick it back and be like, okay, now you basically can't get it. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish every battle plan had one objective that was between two territories like that. <laughs> that would yeah, be. Hilarious. It's just so unfortunate that objectives are so different on every battle plan. And this guy's so mm-hmm. expensive. Because I love that ability. The ability to kick an objective 2d6 is like you're playing a different game at that point. Yeah. And like, oh my god, in Taker Tribes, it's really hilarious because uh, we played like a 1,000 point like ally thing where my ally took Stormcast. Oh, sorry, my ally took Sons of Behemoth and I took Stormcast. And I played Stormkeeps. And he took Taker Tribe to kick the objective 3d6 backwards. And then I put my Liberator on it. And it was like, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Have fun winning this game, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's such a cool effect. I, I really hope they're more inventive going forward with some of their abilities. Like, I really hope 3rd Edition doesn't kill off abilities like this, because it seems like they're moving towards standardizing a lot of stuff. They got rid of Spirit mm-hmm. Flasks. They, they just changed a lot of things with a lot less unique stuff. And I yeah, hope... it's, 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 yeah, I hope they keep yeah, interesting abilities like that. I, I, I hope it's just, or maybe I don't hope. I guess they want to they do it because Stormcast is technically, quote-unquote, the starter faction even though, in my opinion, it's one of the more higher skill ceiling captions. But, uh, yeah, that, that's why they don't want to do complicated stuff like that. But uh, eventually, I, I suppose they will. I also want to point out that I love that it's you kick the objective. You don't push it. You don't you know, move it. You don't grab it. You kick the objective. <laughs> that's just such great flavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. All right, that wraps up all of our allies, right? Nothing else after that? Yeah. Nope. Um, do you guys think we missed anything? You can tell us. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about this before setting up the slides. We thought what's worth including, what isn't. If you think that there's something we're, we're really sleeping on, please let us know, because uh, we just like talking about Stormcast. And I uh, wanted to take a few, maybe like a minute or two here to talk about what we have coming down the pipeline. Kind of started doing this at the end of each episode, just letting you guys know what we're working on next. Uh, so in terms of upcoming videos, we are certainly planning to do a reaction and analysis to the FAQ if, if it ever gets released. And we are planning on updating our tier list that we put out about a month ago in our first video um, based on the FAQ and also based on about a month of playtesting. I don't want to be a channel that's just constantly putting out a new tier list and click baiting people into clicking it. Uh, but I feel like the FAQ could change things significantly and our first impressions, we were off the ball on some units, I'll say that. Uh, I think we slept mm-hmm. on Tempesters. I think I overrated Ballistas. Uh, just because Hurricane of, Raptors. Sometimes stuff isn't... Uh, it's not that it's bad. Like Ballistas aren't bad, but our other shooting is just so good, it's hard to fit Ballistas in the list. Yeah. And, and it took a little bit of time to come to that conclusion. It wasn't immediately obvious that you just would almost never use Ballistas. So they're not bad units by any means. Anyway, uh, another video. I, I think our next video, the one we're working on actively, is going to be about tactics and terminology. A lot of people have requested this, um, kind of explaining what we mean when we say terms like castle or hammer or anvil or alpha strike or, or any of these kind of terms. I think a lot of people have requested this, and uh, it's something I've wanted to do for a little while. And that one will include, I think it's some photos of our armies in certain formations. It's probably easier to show it that way than using some kind of crude MS Paint video. And then after mm-hmm. that, the next video after that will be a Stormcast Battle Tome wish list. So this is just like going to be a compilation of conversations that we just have anyway. Like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, if Vanquishers did two damage instead of having a bonus attack thing? Or wouldn't it be cool if this unit cost 15 points less? You know, how much would it change things? So all kinds of stuff like that. I'm also really into Warhammer Underworlds. And Harrow Deep is coming out soon, hopefully before this video is released. And one of the things I like about Underworlds from a filming perspective is that it doesn't take a lot of space. You can kind of just, you know, it's two people in a little bit of space. Uh, it's a fun game. There's a lot of high and low moments because of the dice rolls and the cards. And nobody really seems to care if your models are painted or unpainted because there's just too many war bands for most people to keep up with. So it's kind of just become the norm to have unpainted models at this point. So I'm planning a, a series of videos on Underworlds, how to play Underworlds, kind of quick tips. Uh, I want to do a battle report on. Harrow Deep, the box itself, 
And then I want to do a video about the new Rivals format, which I think is going to be really popular because deck building is complicated in that game. And it's way easier to just tell people, bring the cards that have your faction symbol on them. It's a lot simpler. <laughs> and finally, on the topic of battle reports, uh, we are going to do them. We are going to call them the Gladiatorium series, named after the mythical arena that Sigmar uses to train his Stormcast. It's not just going to be Stormcast versus Stormcast. Uh, we have a number of armies between us. Uh, we're working on getting the audio and visual equipment that we need for that. It's not as simple a process. I don't want to just use a hand camera and have it look really unprofessional. Thank I want to. I want to make something something that's nice, right? And yeah. uh, uh, there's some hurdles we need to come across in order to get that all set up. Like for example, I own four armies. JJ owns two. Mergank's not in the same country as us, so we're kind of limited on how much we can do just between the three of us. So we'd have to invite some guests in the area, and that it requires time and coordination to set all that up. Uh, we also need mm -hmm. a bigger space than I currently have available to play and record. I don't want people seeing an unfinished basement with a bunch of cobwebs. You know, it's not going to look good. So we got to spend some time setting up a stage, so to speak, and more so than what we would need to play Underworlds. Underworlds, you can play on a coffee table. It's great for that. And we are considering uh, setting up a Patreon type account. I'm not sure if it's going to be Patreon or Subscribestar or one of those other services. Uh, some people have even expressed to us that that they would be willing to help us get funding for that sort of thing. Uh, we put a lot of time into this podcast, um, uncompensated, let's say, and it would be nice to get a little bit of uh, income for the expensive equipment that we would need to get in order to get battle reports set up. So that's not, I don't, we haven't fully ironed out all the plans for that, but I just wanted to mention that we will be thinking about setting up something like that. In terms of community events, uh, up next, we are also planning on doing a list review video. And that series, we want to make a regular series, which we're going to be called calling the Lords of the Storm, which is an, a, a term that the Stormcast used for the, I, I believe it's the Council of Lord Celestins and their, and their advisors. I have to double check that. I'm not a big lore guy. Um, we're going to be opening up list submission for that about two weeks before the episode goes live. There's going to be a new channel created in the Discord. Everybody can put in the list. The community votes on the ones that they want put in the podcast, and of those, the top two uh, go in the in the podcast along with whatever we've been cooking up lately. Uh, I really like doing that first series that we did, just talking about lists is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, JJ, you want to talk about the painting and hobby nights? Yeah, so uh, since we recorded this video, we've actually had our inaugural uh, hobby night, and it was a pretty good time. Uh, um, we we're going to be doing three a week, basically. Um, one on Wednesdays for Wednesday evenings for fans in the Americas. Uh, and then I'm a little bit of a um, crazy person, likes to get up early and start painting at seven in the morning. Uh, so I'll hang out with uh, you European folk. And then late at night, uh, over here at 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. for the uh, Aussie crowd. Yeah, the, the one on Wednesday was, was a lot of fun. I... I didn't know what to expect, but it was just a bunch of dudes hanging out, painting models, talking about stuff they like. It was it was a good time. Yeah, agreed. Yep. So that's that's everything we got going on. Um, quite a lot, considering this is just like a, a hobby thing on the side, right? Yeah. yeah. Are we doing too much, guys? <laughs> I feel like we're doing a lot here. I think we're fine. I'm think having fine fun with it, it, so I don't mind. I, I... Yeah. And we get a lot of good feedback, so I don't. I'm really enjoying that part of it, certainly. Yeah. Mostly good feedback. Yeah, mostly good. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hopefully you found this video on Allies useful. And uh, stay tuned. we got a lot more stuff coming down the pipeline. Take care. See you guys.